evening and welcome to everybody. We are really happy to be all together to start this third inter international webinar from plant health to community health, how smart sensor can improve it. Uh, this is the third edition of the series from plant health to community health, a series of uh, conferences that springs from the um, one health uh, approach that is uh, a founding pillar of uh, our institution, the University of Brescia, that is also hosting and granting this uh, event. Um, the first edition was uh, about uh, plant health in the frame of the International Year of Plant Health in, uh, and the focus the need to reduce losses in order to face uh, the global increasing demand for food and food security problems. The second edition has been more connected to um, the interdependent relations between plant health and human health. Today, we will be focused on smart sensor technology and how the development and application of this technology can help uh, agriculture to be more sustainable, to reduce uh, energy and water consumption, and generally to reduce chemical inputs uh, in farming. The day will, be, will start with this brief uh, opening ceremony and uh, will follow uh, with uh, the scientific session. Uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Maurizio Memo and Emilio Sardini, who are here with me, and Danilo De Marchi, who is uh, somewhere in some airport uh, living for China, uh, will uh, be um, conducting the second part and will give detail about it later on. Mm, I think that now is uh, uh, a pleasure to give the floor to Professor Francesco Castelli, who is the rector of the University of Brescia. Thank you, Professor Gobbi. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so from my side, uh, congratulations to, to yourself, uh, Professor Mem and Professor Sardini for putting together such an exciting event. I understand it's the third edition, and that is once again a, a, a sign of the close connection between engineering, sensor, plants, and neotrasetics, which are, as you said before, one of the pillars of the main subject of our university. I also see a lot of people connected, which is a good sign of the interest of the meeting. And from my side, I just want to, to welcome you all to this virtual session and uh, wish you good work for the day. So once again, welcome, even if we're virtually, to the University of Brescia. Thank you. Uh, and now is an honor to uh, give the floor to Dr. Arvetik Nersisian, Senior Agricultural Officer and Team Leader of the Standard Setting Unit of the International Plant Protection Convention of FAO. As usually, uh, we have the, also this year, we have the support and the honor to host uh, a member of FAO uh, who is giving us, uh, giving to this event uh, a global vision that is needed and is uh, uh, very welcome. Thank you very much, Francesca. Esteemed colleagues, Organizers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm honored to be part of the third international congress or webinar from plant health to community health with this year's focus on innovation such as using smart sensors to improve plant health. Thank you to University of Brescia, particularly Ms. Emanuela Gobi, and Mr. Francesco Castelli for inviting the IPPC Secretariat to this important occasion. Achieving optimum plant health is a feat in itself. It takes action at global, regional, and local levels, as well as innovative approaches.
and the latest technology to effectively prevent, respond, and manage the treat of plant pests. We have the mechanism to achieve this. The International Plant Protection Convention, IPPC, and the International Standard for Phytosanitary Measures, ISPMs, set the benchmark for countries to ensure that plants and plant resources are protected from pests. Therapy, international trade, food security, biodiversity, and ecosystems are also safeguarded. The Convention is an international treaty established in 1951 with the aim of protecting plants and natural resources from the devastating impact of plant pests. It has been ratified by 186 countries, with Somalia recently joining the IPPC. The Commission of Phytosanitary Measures, CPM, governs the IPPC. The IPPC Secretariat is hosted at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations in Rome. IPPC is the only organization dedicated to developing plant health standards. It is recognized by World Trade Organization Agreement on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures. It called SPS Agreement. As such, ISPMs are the only international standards for plant health that contracting parties can apply to ensure safe trade, food security, and environmental protection. Without this mechanism in place, we will continue to lose up to 40% of global crops to plant placed, amounting 220 billion US dollars loss in agricultural production. We stand to lose an essential source of the very air we breathe, 98% of our oxygen intact comes from the plants. Further, trade disruption due to contaminated sea containers will continue to impact the local and global economy, potentially harm local flora of importing countries and contribute to biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. Plant pests are among the biggest factors associated with biodiversity loss. Rich biodiversity and thriving ecosystem are essential for healthy plant to flourish. This is why the convention and international plant health standards need to be applied by countries. Our work based on our IPPC strategic framework 2020-2030, which outlines key objectives to protect global food security, protect the environment from the impact of climate change, and to facilitate safe international trade. At the core of the IPPC work, we ensure that the co collective efforts prevail in the spirit of common goals. This includes applying innovations such as digital technology and making them accessible to countries to better manage plant pests. IPPC Secretariat, along with its partner, recently introduced a state-of-the-art of pest surveillance tool under the IPPC-led African Phytosanitary Program. A customized mobile application was developed to be accessible on a tablet, which would be particularly useful in areas where internet infrastructure is not established. Developed by our partners at the United States Department of Agriculture, the mobile apps allows a field inspector to collect, record, and use data about certain pests, their geolocation, and behavior. Once back online, data will automatically sync on the device. This facility much more speedy and timely decision-making which could effectively halt the spread of pests and the ensuing irreparable damage of high-value crops and ecosystem. The app also comes with the guidance 
in detecting various plant pests that are on country's top list for surveillance. Last month, the IPPC held the first workshop that trained national plant protection organization in 11 pilot African countries to use this digital tool. This is envisaged that trainees will further teach their colleagues and expand their capacity for better pest detection and response. The training will eventually be rolled out in all 54 African countries, further building the pest surveillance capacity of the region. When such a technological tools are made available and accessible to countries, especially those that do not have the optimum capacity, they become better equipped to manage plant pests and prevent outbreaks. The IPPC is also leading the way for countries to adopt the eFITO solution, a suite of online tools that makes international trade safer, faster, and cheaper by, by replacing paper certificates with electronic phytosanitary certificates, or we call it eFITOs. Since its inception in 2018, around 4.5 million eFITOs have been exchanged and 83 countries exchanging them. Indeed, shared technological advancements help in achieving our common goals in protecting plants and natural resources. We encourage you to explore more of IPPC's work by visiting our website and social media accounts. We invite you to reach out for potential collaboration, whether in our core work in developing and implementing standards, in research, campaign, or other events. On behalf of IPPC Secretariat, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our vital work with you, and I wish you a very productive gathering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nesishan. We really appreciate your talk as you gave us a very precise and valuable frame, uh, not only for, for the scientific session that is going to um, occur now, but also for, for the cultural approach we are giving to this uh, series of conferences. In fact, uh, many students from many uh, Italian universities are now attending this uh, conference. And I think that they will uh, enjoy and uh, um, appreciate your uh, talk. Uh, we are also very honored to uh, have FAO participating with us and uh, um, to join these conferences and also is uh, our hope uh, to be able to collaborate uh, in the future also. Thanks again. Uh, and now I will give the floor to Professor Maurizio Memo for the second part of the event. Ciao. Good morning. My name is Mauricio Memo. I am um, the, the moderator of this uh, second part of the conference. Uh, close to me on my side is uh, Professor Emilio Sardini. I don't know if, uh, if uh, you are able to see him, but you will see him later anyway. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes we see him. Okay. Okay. And uh, our job in this uh, in this conference is to take care of the second part of the meeting with, that is characterized by what we call keynote lectures. There are four uh, lecturers and uh, um, from different people. I am going to present the first two, and the second part will be managed by Professor Sardini. Um, 
if uh, people have any comment, any question, any any ideas uh, to share with us, uh, you you are the attendants. Uh, you are able to use the chat and uh, we will collect your thoughts and uh, this uh, will be part uh, of the of the round table at, at the end of the of the of the day of the morning the first uh, the first uh, speaker the first lecturer is uh, professor daniele trinchero he's from the polytechnic of the torino since many years his research interests cover the fields of wireless sensor networks uh, in uh, agriculture, antennas, microwave, circuits, technologies for rural digitalization. Since uh, almost 10 years, he has been president of the largest Italian association against digital divide. Maybe he will say something about it. That is a, a, a hot topic. He's a member of several Italian uh, veteran council association, but this is not part of it. <laughs> this is another story, let's say. Okay. Um, Daniele? Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction, and I apologize for the last uh, five words of my CV. Uh, it was not pertinent to be, uh, even if it is something that I care very much, but it, it was not uh, pertinent to our meeting. Uh, so, um, well, I uh, will start immediately with uh, my presentation, uh, uh, and uh, uh, let me share... Uh, uh, my uh, PowerPoint uh, here. Uh, first of all, uh, I will uh, uh, let me apologize very much for not uh, uh, staying here for the uh, for the total duration of uh, uh, this meeting. Unfortunately, I'm committed with some therapies after a surgery that I had uh, to my shoulder, so. I will have to leave uh, uh, right after 10.30. But uh, there is Umberto Garlando, who knows very well uh, uh, the subject I'm uh, going to speak about, uh, and uh, it will uh, be uh, obviously with you to answer all your questions. In any case, in the very last slide, there will be my email and some contacts, so you can uh, write to me for further uh, communication and discussions, and I'll be very happy to answer uh, to you. So let me uh, introduce uh, this uh, subject uh, today about uh, data transmission, uh, which is uh, very important and it is connected also to my activity that I, uh, I'm doing here in the Polytechnic and also with the association that I contributed to uh, establish, uh, which is obviously the best way to uh, cancel or at least to reduce the digital divide, especially in the countryside. And today we speak about plant care and uh, agriculture is mainly or almost totally in the countryside. So this is really important to identify solutions and ways in order to, um, uh, let's say, uh, avoid or at least reduce as much as we can uh, the digital divide. Um, obviously, speaking about data transmission for agriculture, we cannot avoid to mention the Internet of Things domain, which is something that is very general uh, and it includes uh, nowadays uh, almost everything from uh, inter um, Internet by itself uh, to sensors, uh, to data uh, transmission, uh, wireless sensor network, uh, um, AI, AI. Uh, uh, um, big data, uh, nowadays uh, everything, all the disciplines uh, re, uh, that uh, are uh, referring to the uh, ICT enters into the Internet of Things. Uh, in this uh, global domain, uh, I would like uh, to remember the def official definition uh, which was established uh, several years ago by the IEEE, where uh, the uh, IEEE is just uh, uh, defining the Internet of Things uh, as a network of items. 
in which we embed the sensors, which will contribute to our knowledge because the sensors will act for us as the identification of all physical phenomena that will happen and will take place uh, to something that does not involve directly the presence of a person and of the people. So the sensor is our eye uh, in order to identify and to detect any need that we can uh, then um, treat uh, somewhere else with most of the cases uh, some um, uh, artificial intelligence or in any case some predefined methods or uh, DSS uh, in order to uh, help, in our case, the plants to grow better and uh, to uh, combat the uh, weather change from uh, one side and the new diseases from the other side. So sensors are uh, a key point, but another key point is the uh, box in the middle in this scheme, which is the networking and data communication. And we are going to speak about this middle point. Um, just speaking about IEEE, I always like when I speak about uh, uh, IoT for agriculture to show this, which was the first scheme about IoT published by the IEEE, where you see all possible applications of IoT but one is missing. Eh? You see healthcare, you see logistics, you see uh, even home uh, and uh, uh, home automation, you don't see agriculture. Uh, so uh, the, first, the very first proposals of uh, uh, IoT applications, uh, uh, actually, even if agriculture is something that uh, is incredibly demanding the need of uh, data transmission, data acquisition, data transmission, data processing, uh, uh, in the very beginning it was not considered. Why? Uh, basically because of the digital divide, because in the very beginning uh, nobody was thinking about uh, the possibility to um, bring technology in, uh, in the agriculture field, uh, thinking about the distance in terms of lack of infrastructures, but also the distance in terms of lack of knowledge by the agricultural people. Uh, big error because as soon as uh, the uh, technology arrived in uh, in agriculture, immediately uh, we start having a lot of publication and scientific works uh, in uh, several journals, meaning that uh, this uh, initial paradigm was not very um, uh, uh, very correct. But uh, uh, having said this, uh, let's uh, enter into the details uh, of uh, this data transmission. Normally in uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the engineering community, uh, we refer to the communication that involve uh, uh, things and not the people as a communication occurring between machines. So um, very often uh, in uh, the next slides, I will speak about machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication and machine-to-machine -machine communication is uh, something that can happen with uh, the capability to use uh, a large variety of media, uh, uh, satellites, uh, um, mobile communications, uh, or uh, ad hoc networks. Um, all these uh, possible media are possible solution that uh, are uh, very suitable in order to uh, avoid uh, or to reduce uh, the digital divide. Uh, these uh, um, uh, solutions are normally implemented through another concept that is very uh, um, repetitive uh, in uh, all the publication that uh, uh, we read about uh, uh, data collection for agriculture, which is uh, the usage of uh, wireless sensor networks. Uh, so which are the characteristics of the network that uh, is uh, normally applied uh, to uh, the uh, collection of data from sensors? Normally, we use very low data rates uh, because we do not need to transfer a lot of information 
information uh, because uh, normally uh, when we want to detect uh, something uh, uh, related to agriculture, related to a plant, uh, the number of uh, uh, bits that uh, are representing the situation are minimal. Think about a temperature or a humidity or, for example, the quantity of water in the terrain. We speak about numbers. We don't speak about videos in high definition. Uh, these are sensors that we do not like to maintain and to uh, uh, care very often. So normally they are very limited in terms of uh, um, energy demanding, which means that we allow this technology to survive without any maintenance, typically for a very long time. Uh, we like to have uh, um, network topologies and network infrastructure which are very simple and uh, we like to have uh, a number of uh, additional uh, um, characteristics of the technology that are uh, extremely simple to maintain and uh, avoiding uh, uh, day per day uh, um, presence of uh, uh, of the uh, people that should uh, maintain them. But another thing that is very important is uh, to be able to bring uh, this technology and especially the data communication everywhere, even in uh, very remote places uh, which are uh, not uh, covered uh, maybe by any other kind of a service. Uh, this uh, table that was represented in the previous slide is very well summarized by uh, this scheme. You see, we, no we need something uh, uh, looking at uh, this slide from uh, uh, the right to the left, uh, uh, top to bottom, uh, we need something that is uh, very strong uh, and very robust because the environment outside in the agricultural field is uh, absolutely tough in terms of uh, possibility of breaks. It has to be uh, small, it has to be easy uh, to access by any people that is involved in uh, with the work in the fields. It has uh, to uh, work with very small energy, so uh, battery supplied is a very good uh, um, solution and batteries should last for a very long time. It has to be reliable, so it has to be comparable with uh, technology that is providing uh, a good uh, answer in terms of uh, uh, the kind of uh, the measurement that is uh, done, so reliable, so uh, repeatable, and so on. And uh, the very last uh, figure, uh, bottom uh, right, uh, is representing the, our need to bring this technology everywhere and to connect to this technology everywhere. Even if it is a desert or almost a desert, a mountain, uh, an island, or anything which we can uh, uh, think about as a remote place. Uh, technologies available for this are a lot. Uh, let me uh, now take the next uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, in order to 10 to 15 minutes in order to identify which are the best technologies that we can use in order to go in uh, these places, which normally we uh, uh, define as remote and uh, to collect our data. At first, uh, we have to distinguish two different approaches. Uh, those technologies that uh, use uh, reserved spectrum, so reserved frequencies, or uh, technologies that uh, use uh, unlicensed frequencies, which is the difference between the two. The first, uh, we, uh, they can be uh, um, uh, still divided into uh, categories. Uh, there are some reserved frequencies that are uh, kept by the government. Okay, let's forget about that because uh, it will be for a very uh, limited uh, amount of application, for example, uh, civil protection or so on. Uh, other uh, frequencies are just uh, paid by some operators and they are responsible of these frequencies uh, autonomously, which means that uh, obviously frequencies like that can be used to uh, provide the technologies normally is considered more reliable, but also more expensive. 
Otherwise, we can use uh, frequencies that can be shared by uh, everybody. Uh, these are normally referred as unlicensed. The good thing of unlicensed frequencies is uh, that uh, uh, these frequencies can be used by everybody. But uh, as you uh, can easily understand, uh, you have to put rules because if everybody can speak uh, all together in the same time, uh, then uh, uh, for us, uh, it will be very hard to identify the voice that is dedicated to us uh, and compared to the voice that uh, is used by another person that is speaking to uh, another person as well. So um, the two major categories that we uh, are going to analyze are the licensed uh, technologies or technologies using licensed frequencies and technologies using unlicensed frequencies. Normally for unlicensed frequencies, we have some uh, uh, frequency bands which are uh, typically very limited uh, and uh, uh, in origin uh, they were used for uh, industrial scientific and medical applications these uh, uh, frequency bands uh, can be used for free so we don't have to register uh, to the government we have not to uh, pay for the usage of the, uh, of the frequencies everybody can use but you see uh, the um, uh, amount of uh, frequencies available uh, compared to the total amount of frequencies that are uh, uh, inside of the frequency spectrum is uh, very small. And this is a, a forced uh, limitation. Which are the technologies that uh, have appeared in the years uh, using uh, unlicensed frequencies? You see here, we have uh, uh, the very first uh, uh, work done, uh, it was done with Wi-Fi. Why? Because Wi-Fi was born in 1997 and when it was born, it was very cheap. Then uh, uh, Bluetooth in particular uh, for the IoT, uh, we speak about Bluetooth low energy. Um, there is technology that was specifically developed uh, for this uh, ZigBee uh, and it's a uh, uh, bigger version of a six low pan. And then we have two technologies that are exploding nowadays, especially the last one, uh, the LoRa and LoRa one, but also the Sigfox and all technologies are based on the usage of uh, ultra narrow band. So license free as a number of limitation, because uh, as I said, when uh, we wanted to use a license free, we have to be compatible with the fact that other people will use the same technology and the same frequencies. So we have to limit uh, the power. We have to introduce a concept which is extremely limiting, which is the duty cycle. Uh, we have to uh, manage the network on our own. And normally, we use technology that is cheaper. Huh? Uh, which are the benefits of the fact that we can uh, uh, build up our network so we can uh, bring this technology everywhere, also where normally there is a situation of a digital divide. The major problem with the usage of uh, the uh, unlicensed frequencies is this concept of a duty cycle. So basically every device cannot be transmitting and cannot be working all the time, but the majority of the time has to be be silent. Why? Because we have to allow other devices to speak when uh, we are not uh, speaking. Eh? This uh, for sure is a limitation and if you have a check of this table, especially uh, the first three rows uh, there, this is the official table uh, uh, published in Europe by the ERC, uh, you see that uh, there are some frequencies which are limited for one uh, over 1,000 on the time, which means that in one hour, you have the possibility to transmit only 3.6 seconds, which is an extremely limited amount of time dedicated to our transmission. But this will be enough or not if we consider that the majority of the plant care data management is related to the fact that we have just to detect evolution of physical parameters like uh, the temperature, the humidity, uh, the wetness, or the amount of rain that is dropping down, well, basically, even if we do measurement every one second in one hour or maybe one second every 10 minutes, we can fit uh, the uh, major prescription in these tables and we can still obtain some data. So this is a limitation which is limiting the majority of the application of the IoT in the industrial domain, but in agriculture, 
it does not. So it is something that we can definitely uh, think to use. In terms uh, of uh, uh, the frequency bands that I showed you before, the best ones are the ones uh, between the 868 megahertz used in Europe and 915 megahertz, which are used in US. Because in uh, these frequency ranges, we have uh, quite a nice uh, frequency propagation and uh, we will see technology by technology but we can arrive in some cases up to um, a range which can be also 100 kilometers and uh, the dimension of the antennas you, you see in the last uh, column represented on the right with these frequency bands is around five centimeters so something that is allowing to build up a very small very compact device um, other limitations about the usage of these frequencies if we use uh, frequencies above one gigahertz normally these are available worldwide and mainly uh, we do not apply the duty cycle um, the typical band that is uh, used above one gigahertz is the 2.4 gigahertz which is the one used typically by the traditional wi-fi uh, when we go below one gigahertz, we have a more interesting characteristics from the side of the propagation, but unfortunately, we have uh, uh, some uh, counterparts. You see uh, different countries represented here, and in different countries, uh, we have uh, different uh, available bands, which means that if you build up a device that is considered to work in China, when you move to Europe or to, you move to USA, you will have totally two uh, uh, redesign and to uh, rebuild the radio components because this wall this will be uh, not compatible with the, the other ones. Uh, let's move to the technologies for license frequencies. So the evolution is from uh, obviously the mobile applications, uh, in particular the first IoT um, application was uh, by the usage of uh, traditional GSM. Nowadays the GSM is as involved in EC GSM IoT. And then the 3G was not uh, uh, introducing any IoT application. The 4G and nowadays the 5G are uh, introducing the most interesting standards. In particular, the 4G is introducing the LTAM, which is a very good standard, but a bit heavy from the side of, of energy requirements, and uh, narrowband IoT, which is uh, typically used for uh, application in the cities like uh, water metering uh, or gas uh, uh, accounting, gas metering, and so on. Um, it is not very evident uh, a good and big interest in terms of application of narrowband IoT and LTM to agriculture, but uh, the reason is just one. It is because uh, they are expensive, because in order to use uh, these technologies, you have to pay an operator. Obviously, you have uh, a number of benefits because uh, the operator is building his uh, own network by its own. Uh, obviously, uh, since they are licensed frequencies, uh, uh, we have a possibility to uh, transmit uh, at a power which is higher and you have less interferences. Uh, on the, the other side, you have not the possibility to control uh, the network of the operator. So if the operator is not present for any reason in the place where you want to monitor your plants, obviously you are not going to have uh, a solution and then you are not connecting the, uh, any sensor to any plant because you won't be able to, uh, uh, to transmit your data. Uh, Danilo has recently experienced something like this in a field where uh, he wanted to do some experiments and in fact uh, we are uh, uh, building up together an infrastructure obviously uh, based on unlicensed frequency in order to compensate the lack of uh, uh, coverage uh, in the specific area where uh, we wanted to do uh, these uh, uh, tests and these experiments. From the side of the topologies of the networks, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, possibilities offered by uh, all these technologies that I mentioned before. Uh, we move from uh, the um, 
simple connection between uh, two end devices uh, to a device uh, uh, that is uh, uh, connecting to a star of uh, elements, uh, or uh, uh, you see in the bottom more structure uh, infra uh, elements like um, a, a tree uh, topology that is using repeaters, uh, the green dots, uh, in order to extend the range of uh, a device when the device, the red, uh, uh, central device is not capable to reach uh, all of the end devices, the yellow ones, uh, or a uh, more complex infrastructure, which is the mesh, where uh, you use uh, repeaters, but every repeater is capable also to act autonomously to identify the best solution to connect it to another repeater in the uh, surroundings. Uh, the um, uh, uh, way uh, these uh, uh, technologies are uh, uh, introducing uh, a, a kind of uh, um, uh, coverage, uh, and so they are uh, fighting the uh, digital divide, is uh, normally represented uh, uh, with uh, uh, this slide that I uh, always like uh, uh, to offer. Uh, if I want to reach a very remote region, either I have to transmit at a higher power, uh, so louder voice. Uh, this is normally not possible because we have uh, some limitation, even uh, with uh, the license frequency, but all also with unlicensed frequencies and ma major limitations, uh, as we saw, are uh, applied to unlicensed frequencies. So the alternative is uh, to uh, set up and to use a technology that is much more sensitive in order to have better hears and uh, to hear uh, the content of information uh, that is uh, transmitted by somebody that is using uh, a very low uh, voice. Or, another technology that is more complex from the side of uh, the organization of the network is uh, uh, the word of mouth. So we use repeaters in order to arrive further where one single uh, person is not capable to uh, speak and to have a voice that is arriving there. So um, these are the characteristics of uh, the technologies. Uh, as I said, the first one that appeared was the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi uh, has a technology that nowadays is uh, called Wi-Fi Allow, uh, which is a specific uh, version uh, and amendments of the Wi-Fi that is usable for uh, the uh, um, Internet of Things, and it has very limited application in agriculture. Normally, we find the Wi-Fi alone, which is uh, expensive in terms of energy uh, for uh, the um, uh, indoor cultivations, uh, uh, greenhouse uh, application, basically. But in this field, it can be uh, used because normally in greenhouse we have the possibility to uh, have a direct energy supply. Uh, this is uh, a first table that we will fill uh, little by little in uh, these last five minutes. Uh, as you see, uh, the column of the range, the, the Wi-Fi, uh, is offering the possibility to arrive to a maximum range of 500 meters. So you can understand that uh, the limitations are uh, typical of the range of just uh, a greenhouse. You see the data rate in the last column on the right, 150 kilobit, which is not a lot in terms of using this technology, for example, to transmit a video, but is more than enough if you want just to transmit a few data, even too much to transmit a few data. Another technology that uh, can be used for IoT is Bluetooth. In particular, the Bluetooth Low Energy is uh, the technology that has uh, been introduced uh, almost uh, nine years ago in order to reduce uh, uh, very much the energy consumption and to simplify the usage of uh, the uh, frequency spectrum at the time. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is uh, permitting, for example, the possibility to do uh, the so-called broadcasting. So you have a device that does not require to connect to a specific master, but it can connect to anybody. Uh, this is very uh, nice because it has the possibility to 
ma manufacture of the so-called uh, Bluetooth beacons, which are devices that are just uh, transmitting in general broadcasting like RFIDs uh, are doing. Uh, you see, which is the counterpart of the Bluetooth low energy, second row here, compared to the Wi-Fi, uh, we have reduced uh, the range. It is uh, almost uh, 300 meters, but uh, we can uh, transmit uh, data rate, uh, which uh, very high uh, rate compared to the Wi-Fi. Um, distance is uh, reduced, power consumption is very reduced. Typical application of a Bluetooth low energy for uh, agriculture is uh, local identification. Uh, uh, so we have devices that are applied to a plant or something else, and uh, we wanted to detect uh, the plant when we pass uh, uh, nearby. Uh, it is uh, a variation of RFID technology. Um, uh, you have uh, some details here uh, for your further uh, interest, but uh, for all the technologies that uh, I will examine, uh, but obviously I won't discuss here. These are examples of a Bluetooth beacon that uh, can be applied also for uh, agriculture. Other technologies are the ones uh, that enter into the umbrella of the so-called uh, IEEE 802.15.4, which are technologies that typically use uh, the mesh, so the repeaters. Uh, so we have uh, typical ranges uh, of the ZigBee uh, in uh, the two frequency bands uh, below one gigahertz and uh, above one gigahertz, you see, are very limited. Every single device doesn't reach a distance which is more than 150 meters uh, in the best case, but uh, they are uh, characterized by very low power uh, communications and uh, they are characterized by the possibility of uh, using the mesh, so the word of mouth, so we can uh, uh, extend the range and uh, there are examples in the literature of ZB technology used for agriculture covering even uh, uh, extension of uh, 10 or more kilometers. Obviously, the uh, uh, network that is used by implementing the mesh is very complex. And the risk is that if some repeaters will break in between, your uh, devices will uh, be interrupted in the communication. So uh, even for the ZB, you have uh, some details uh, here. Other uh, scenario is uh, one that has emerged uh, recently, which is uh, uh, the so-called LP1, which is the idea of the LP1 is uh, to use a technology that is capable to arrive very far. And by arriving very far, you have the possibility to avoid the use of repeaters. You have just one single big cell to which every device will connect. Uh, this is uh, the principle. Normally, the uh, LP1 uh, technologies uh, allow to arrive to very long ranges, uh, and uh, they provide very limited data rate. So they are located in this uh, green box that you see here on the bottom of the right uh, in uh, this graph. Uh, the major technologies that uh, you can have here are LTM, MB, IoT, which are licensed uh, technologies, or Lorenz and CFOS, which are unlicensed technologies. Among the licensed, the last evolutions are the ECC GSM IoT, which is still a 2G technology, which arrives to uh, a, a about 200 kilobit per second, and LTM and narrowband IoT, which are reduced. They arrive to uh, limited data rate, which is more than enough, but especially the narrowband IoT is characterized by a very good uh, energy uh, um, uh, consumption. You, you see the, uh, this table here that I will leave to your uh, further analysis. I'm not going to comment when on the opposite, I'm going to see which is the difference between these three technologies compared to the ones that we have seen before. And in the column of the range, you can see that uh, all these technologies will allow the possibility to connect the devices up to five or 10 kilometers with even a better data rate in some cases, 
but with the possibility to avoid complex infrastructures and repeaters. Obviously, you pay into this because you have to subscribe a contract to an operator because these are licensed technologies and cannot be operated by anybody. Uh, you wanted to do something where you operate an LP1 technology by yourself, you can do, you go unlicensed. For, with the unlicensed, you have two possibilities. One possibility is to use the ultra narrow band, which is commercially implemented by a company that uh, is called CFOX. Nowadays, it has changed the name. Uh, the concept is very simple. You use a very small portion of the spectrum in order to transmit your data. And this is something that will allow to have an incredible uh, uh, possibility in terms of a uh, good era of the receiver. You see ultra narrow band compared to the previous technologies, uh, the last row here. And you see that we arrive to 40 kilometers uh, declared and normally maintained. Um, and this uh, is uh, a, a characteristic that is uh, extremely good. Uh, another, these are uh, some details about the ultra narrow band. And the last one that I want to show you is uh, Valora. Velora is a technology that uh, is using a different approach. I'm not entering into the details of the approach, but basically it is something that allows to extend very much the duration of the symbol in order to uh, allow you to have a, a good reception or even if you are in a noisy environment. Uh, LoRa is, uh, uh, is being deployed very much in uh, uh, the world nowadays. And you see, in this table that is comparing also the characteristic of Velora, we have the possibility to have a connection which are demonstrated that arrive up to 100 kilometers without any repetition and just with one single link between the sensor and the master. Uh, you will see other slides uh, here, uh, which I leave to you, and I'm not going to connect more to uh, uh, avoid to steal your time more than what I have already done, uh, uh, where you will see further uh, uh, details about the uh, uh, specific characteristic of LoRa, but it is not the case uh, during the presentation to speak about this. And uh, in the very last uh, uh, components of the slides, uh, you will see also some examples of application of the various technologies that I mentioned, just to understand that every technology can be suitable for agricultural application. We have just to know which are the limits and the benefits of every technology and identify the best solution where to apply. I thank you very, very much for attending. And uh, I'm sorry about the fact that I won't be able uh, to participate to open discussion, but uh, there will be for sure uh, uh, Umberto that uh, will have a possibility to uh, speak uh, instead of me, even better than me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an area of a uh, 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 high degree of development and uh, things are moving, but also changing. And uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of work uh, behind what we use. We are used some some terminology that we uh, use every day, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, in our house, in our home, in our car, and so on. But um, there is a, a world that no. Not not all the people know. So thank you for your thank you for your lecture. And uh, now we move to the second speaker uh, is uh, Roberto La Rosa. Roberto La Rosa is uh, is from uh, um, is a research senior staff member of uh, ST Microelectronics in Catania. He works there on projects related to ultra low power application, wireless low power transfer, energy harvesting, and very high frequency power conversion. He has several patents, uh, several paper in uh, related with advanced strategies and techniques for powering wireless sensor nodes. Uh, Dr. La Rosa, are you? 
connect yes. with Good us. Morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm very glad and honored to be here. So, um, Again, good morning, everybody. My name is Roberto La Rosa. I work for Steam Electronics, where I am the responsible for ultra low power applications. And today, my talk will be uh, on how to improve uh, plant health with smart autonomous sensors, autonomous from um, uh, the point of view of the energy. Uh, my presentation will go through uh, highlighting what is the problem and this, and of course, the solution that we propose. We uh, will describe how the solution works, and uh, I will mention few application, uh, few application areas, and finally, I will conclude with takeaways of this conversation. Um, okay, uh, the problem uh, we see uh, actually it's a uh, more an opportunity. We see that uh, uh, both smart irrigation and precision farming we need a lot. Uh, uh, we have a big need of sensing. And uh, we see also from uh, a company point of view that uh, there is a, um, a rising, a good trend on the marketing, which is rising. So this is mo this motivates us to invest is both smart irrigation and precision uh, farming and uh, where we foresee a, a big opportunity to increase uh, the volumes of the sensors that we can produce and sell. But uh, nothing comes for free. In fact, um, this is uh, all true only if we can solve the problem of the maintenance. And so today, uh, increasing in the number of sensors uh, is uh, basically limited by the possibility uh, to put a larger number of sensors, as uh, for instance, we need in agriculture. Because if we want to have a good monitor in agriculture, we need uh, to disseminate sensors. And this means that uh, we need to install a, a very big number of sensors. Now, in this case, the big numbers for us is an opportunity, but at the same time is also uh, a problem to which we need to find a solution. Because uh, um, if I have to install uh, a limited number of sensors, um, then uh, the maintenance could be manageable. But if I want to disseminate in crops, in a large field of crops, uh, thousands of sensors, then the maintenance is, of course, um, not sustainable in terms of costs, in terms of labor. And so for this reason, we need to find a solution. And as engineers, we are working for that. So according to that, we our uh, ideal uh, sensor for uh, uh, agriculture does not have to be maintenance. And the maintenance normally in the state of the art sensor is basically the battery. The battery we know as a, a limited number of years after which we lose capacitance and we need to go and replace uh, the sensor if not the, uh, the the battery if not the sensor so the ideal sensor should be of course wireless maintenance free it's a very important and we are adding a very much uh, a big attention on low cost so the, of course this is another problem uh, related to big numbers. If we have to store big numbers, any penny is counting. We know that. We get it as a feedback from our customers. So as engineers in this field, we need to look carefully at the costs. So reducing costs is a really uh, one guideline that we need to follow. And in many cases, uh, uh, also miniaturization is a problem. So we need also to work in order to have an, a compact form factor. So if we will want a battery, what is the solution? The solution is to go through energy harvesting as much as we can. And so the key feature uh, we have, uh, uh, in this case, we are working and investing on energy autonomous and battery free devices that, that for us means maintenance free. And, uh, and in terms of communications, we have seen uh, before with the uh, incredible and beautiful speech from uh, Professor uh, Tricero that uh, there are so many uh, so many ways to communicate. We are investigating uh, in this case uh, today two uh, main um, connectivities. One is the Bluetooth low energy co uh, communications and the LoRa and the LoRa one protocol as a connectivity. Um, the final goal is to have something easy to configure and the center forget device. But I will stress uh, future, in, the in the future slides 
that uh, our system tends to be agnostic. So we provide a solution uh, that is uh, viable for any kind of uh, uh, connectivity, any kind of transmission. Now, the first product we had in our roadmap is um, um, the, what we call is a sensor platform that uh, we call uh, uh, um, SDS BF Tag 01. BF stands for battery free. Uh, Tag is the first version. This is an energy autonomous, completely battery free device. So this system does not have a battery, has um, the, 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 the power, the energy is stored in a very small capacitor. You can see it here. It's just two SMD ceramic capacitor, very cheap. And uh, the energy in the default version, so the version that we um, basically um, deploy to our customer, it has got the uh, uh, solar cell, so which is a 15 by 15 centimeter, so a 15 by 15 millimeter. So the wall system is 20 by 20 millimeters. Uh, the system um, uses a Bluetooth low energy communication and uh, is a, a totally implemented with off the shelf device. This is a very important and precious uh, aspect because what I want to remark today is that energy harvesting is not an upcoming technology, but it's what, something that we can do it today. And the, more than that, we can do it today with uh, off-the-shelf devices that we have in other catalog since uh, years. What you see here is um, one of these two components, the STM32L0 uh, that we have in our catalog since 10 years. And also we are using a Bluetooth low energy module, which is Bluetooth low energy. Um, we are also adding here, as you can see, uh, a humidity and temperature sensor, uh, just uh, to add the sensor and uh, demonstrate that we um, can add a um, sense, but uh, sensing, but any kind of sensor could be added to this platform because the platform could be, of course, scaled to any kind of sensing as we, in the same way, we're adding the humidity and temperature sensor. Uh, the important um, aspect of this uh, um, system is that we, without the battery, by just getting energy from any energy harvesting, in this case, we are using a very small solar cell just to demonstrate that uh, with a 15 by 15 millimeter uh, solar cell, we have enough energy to sustain the Bluetooth communication. Uh, we can add the other source of energy harvesting. Uh, we can add any kind of sensing um, off the shelf devices. Uh, an important aspect of, of this is that we also reuse the harvester uh, as a sensor. In this case, this uh, uh, system is able to monitor also uh, the luminosity if uh, we are uh, providing the power by using a photovoltaic cell. And I will show you this in details uh, in the following slide. Our idea is that we can measure the power that from uh, our harvesting uh, source, uh, from our power source, uh, because um, the energy that we, it, it, the, the system works in this way. The energy that we harvest at every cycle, uh, as you can see here, the system uh, uh, has a two different state. An harvesting say, state where the voltage of the store, which is the voltage uh, through the storage capacitor, across the, uh, the storage capacitor, uh, uh, rises from a lower voltage to an higher voltage. And in this case, the system is uh, in ultra low power mode and is able to harvest energy. So the voltage in this story is, uh, is rising. And when we have enough energy, uh, uh, that means that uh, the voltage uh, of the storage capacitor is arrived at VH, we know that we have enough energy to perform, um, to, to perform a transmission or a sensing or whatever is the action that we want to do. So, but uh, we know that uh, the energy is constant in this particular case, the energy, oops, sorry. The energy that we have acquired is uh, uh, equal to storage times VH to the power of two minus VL to the power of two divided by two. So this is a constant for us, which is very important. So if we know how much is the energy, then if we can measure the, the time uh, interleaved from, uh, uh, in, in the harvesting, uh, during the harvesting, which is the advertising time, uh, then in this case, uh, we can know the power because energy is equal to power to time. So the only 
uh, known in this case is the power that we can indirectly measure through the measurement of the advertising time. And the advertising time, we can measure it at the base station remotely. And the base station is normally a device that does not have a problem of power. So we can leisurely do it at the base station and uh, by measuring the interleaving time from one transmission to another transmission. So uh, sensing uh, of uh, the power source, which is uh, a basically an indirect, uh, something that comes for free, which is important for two reasons. First of all, uh, uh, I recall that we want to do a system that are low cost. So if we can minimize the number of sensors, we already go in the direction to have a low cost system. But low cost means not only from an economical point of view in this case, but also from an energetical point of view. Because uh, um, any sensor, if uh, any, any sensor that I add, it's also the power budget that is going to increase. And if I increase the power budget, I need to increase the size of the storage capacitor. And this goes uh, against the miniaturization um, uh, um, specification that sometimes I have. So what I want to do is to reduce the storage, the capacity, the storage capacitor as much as possible. So if I can reuse uh, um, the power source as a storage, uh, as a, a sensor, this is a, a double benefit. So it's basically kind of disruptive feature. Now, uh, this is a characterization we have seen that we can uh, basically monitor uh, the luminosity with a 15 by 15 uh, solar cell. Just to give an idea, we have a limited detection of the luminosity of 500 lux. And uh, all we have to do is just to measure the time, which is the simplest thing that we can think to do. So it's in basically 10 domain uh, reading and uh, it's very simple to perform in any base station and also at low power. Uh, we have uh, uh, Bluetooth low energy is uh, uh, kind of attractive because uh, the reader is uh, very simple to implement. In fact, uh, we just had to implement uh, an app uh, that is running in any tablet or, uh, um, or, or mobile phone. And uh, through this app, we can uh, that it can be downloaded by the Android store um, from Google Store. Uh, we we are able uh, to link uh, our sensor and uh, okay and uh, have a more uh, have a, um, not a real time more but a continuous monitor of light intensity, temperature, and humidity. Just because we have limited to this the, our our sensors now. Um, so as you can see, this uh, system is very easy to to install. I just have to put uh, uh, to install the sensor where I have enough light and uh, just to read it uh, the data from uh, through uh, uh, in, uh, through an app. Uh, we have tried this system in agriculture, and uh, we have seen uh, with the total energy communication. And uh, we have seen that after several measurements, the longest distance was uh, 160 meters, basically in line to what uh, Professor Chiquero said before, uh, which, which is, uh, uh, he was talking about a distance of 150 meters. In this case, we have a maximum distance of 160 meters in Y yards. Of course, we are not happy for that because uh, um, the, cast, the, the feedback we have from our customers that uh, the distance is not very exciting. And for this reason, we are now uh, working on LoRa. And we have a system that is working on LoRa. Uh, one thing I want to remark, our system is agnostic from uh, um, the power source, is agnostic from uh, uh, the radio communication, and also from the number of sensors. So our main, main core is uh, to get energy, uh, how to get energy in an efficient way. In this case, for instance, we are reproposing the system just by um, uh, changing the kind of connectivity and we are using LoRa, uh, both in peer-to-peer -peer and in LoRa one. Um, we have a, um, a, a new microcontroller, which is embedding the LoRa uh, as a big gigahertz radio that it can work with uh, long range. And it is called uh, STM32WL55. And uh, as you can see in this microchip, we have almost 80% of what we need to perform a wireless sensor node, which is energy autonomous. In fact, we have the power management is embedded in the STM32WL, the microcontroller, of course, and also we embed the radio unit in sub -gigat. So just by adding 
a solar cell and adding uh, a storage capacitor and of course the sensors we can we are able to um, to build uh, and design uh, a wire sensor node with a long range connectivity we are tried we uh, we can also perform uh, sensing of uh, uh, resistors that are uh, uh, that uh, are variable in time. For instance, we are uh, exploring this system we, to measure the impedance of a plant, which is related to the health to, of the plant. And in this case, what we do is uh, uh, when we discharge the, the, the charge that we have uh, accumulated, uh, stored in the storage element, uh, we just have to measure the, time, the discharge time. So in this case, by measuring the discharge time, again, with just uh, the default, uh, just um, uh, with uh, a simple counter that uh, isn't expensive from the power consumption point of view, we can measure uh, the resistor. So we can, uh, again, this goes uh, in the direction of having a, a simple uh, system, which goes in the direction to be low cost. So this is what uh, we have uh, uh, experimented. Uh, we can uh, read the data uh, through the gateway uh, when we use the LoRa one, uh, the LoRa one protocol, and um, we are able to send a beacon every time we have acquired the energy. As you can see here, basically we have a beacon every twenty seconds, and uh, so the time from one beacon to another is, uh, um, in this case is 20 seconds with a luminosity of, uh, we had a luminosity of about uh, uh, 3,000 lux. Um, we, are, we are getting beacons every every time, and the, the, the time distance depends on, the, of course, the energy that we are getting from the environment. In this case, the luminosity, and our uh, in our case, it was 3,000 lux. Uh, we have tried the system. And uh, we have characterized the system uh, with LoRa in order to understand what are our energy needs. And uh, this, of course, depends on several factors, mainly from the spreading factor, which is related to the distance and uh, the packet length that we want to send. So if we have a spreading factor 7 that we have seen uh, in Catania in a very busy area with a lot of buildings, uh, we have achieved the maximum distance of 500 meters. So with spreading factor seven, we can um, basically think about uh, a distance of 500 meters. If we send up to 30 bytes, we just need the capacitance of two millifarads. Uh, instead, if we want to go farther and we want to arrive to 12 kilometers, uh, we have a spreading factor 12. And with a spreading factor 12, if we send up to 10 bytes, we need a capacitance of 16 millifarads. What you see in the bottom is uh, a capacitor that has been built with a laser on uh, a cork, uh, on a cork stopper. And uh, this capacitance has a value of uh, uh, 16 millifarads. So uh, I put this picture here just to show that we are also thinking about systems that are sustainable, okay, environmental, uh, environmental um, friendly. And uh, having uh, this technology also uh, uh, projects us in the direction of uh, of eco, eco compatibility and uh, sustainability, and this is another direction that uh, we are going, uh, we are following. So not only electronics, but also an eye of uh, of, of the ecosystem to, uh, towards the ecosystem. I don't know what is happening to my computer, but uh, okay, okay. So uh, this is just to give some numbers and. Uh, um, uh, give an idea of the feasibility. So the system is uh, highly feasible, either with standard components, but uh, with also upcoming components which are um, uh, eco-friendly and go in the direction of the sustainability. Uh, we also use a solar cell. I don't know if you can use, uh, uh, if you can see my camera, where we have uh, basically uh, a pro uh, photovoltaic cell which are printed on uh, PET, which is a material that uh, go, is very inexpensive, very, very, very well known. And uh, this is going to reduce the costs of our systems also. Um, this is, uh, um, again, uh, a, a use case. 
uh, which is uh, very related to agri-food. In this case, we have uh, our aim was uh, to show that uh, uh, biocompatibility and sustainability is uh, really possible. We are monitoring here an hive, which is uh, uh, made by an open. This is a, a South American uh, hive with uh, singular uh, bees. And we have uh, two sensors, uh, two BF tag. One is internally to, to the hive, one is externally. Here you see the uh, internal sensor. And uh, the, the nice thing of, of, of this uh, experiment is that uh, the power that uh, e, e, the, the sensors are powered uh, uniquely from the plants. So you see the plants here, these plants are, are generating uh, the, the power for those sensors. So we are uh, monitoring uh, an hive, but the power in this case is uh, uh, provided by the plants. Um, the mechanism is that uh, in the soil of the plants, we have bacteria, which are biogenic, uh, electrogenic bacteria that uh, as an outcome or the metabolism, they produce electrons. And we are able to collect the electrons and with the energy that we get uh, from these uh, um, free electrons, we are able to sustain our electronics. So to send beacons from the energy that we can uh, recover from a plant uh, is possible. So it's feasible and we're working in uh, the direction to reinforce this uh, concept and um, build systems that are reliable. We have a problem, the only problem that we are solving this uh, solvable in a short time is uh, the durations of uh, the electrodes. And after that, I think this te technology could be widespread in the agri-food industry. Um, another uh, application um, on, on which we are working is uh, the idea um, to uh, have uh, to avoid empirical. Um, uh, 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 I mean, when we talk about smart irrigation, uh, uh, as of today, the state of the art is that uh, the irrigation is done uh, on the basis of empirical algorithms. So the idea is that uh, if I have to water uh, this um, grass, uh, I, I do it uh, with a recipe that um, is changing uh, a, a, a season by season, but normally we are not sure that it is the right one. So nobody is sure if the quantity that we are providing to the plant is, is the right one. Uh, what we want to do is uh, to close the loop. So if we can put a sensor, we can basically have uh, the plant to say to us, hey, I am thirsty, I need some, some water. And uh, of course we, we can provide the water and after the plant, of course can say to us, no, I don't need any other water. So the idea is to provide in a scientific way, the right amount of water to the plant. With the, of course, we can imagine the benefits. First of all, we can save water eventually. And secondly, the, the plant will have the best health. And is this possible? Yes, if we are able to disseminate the sensors that are uh, set and forget. Uh, another point that we are doing is a battery-free water controller. So also the water controller is completely battery-free. What you see here, this is an example of a water controller where we are harvesting energy through a turbine. The idea is that we have uh, two solenoids uh, or, or could be two or more solenoids. What we see in the top is a solenoid that is actually sending the water to the plant. And of course, we have a super cup. We don't have a battery. So this is maintenance free. You don't have any wiring. OK, um, we don't have any battery and any wiring. So all uh, when we connect this uh, water control, we just have to connect to the pipes. No cables, no batteries, no maintenance. Uh, the upper uh, solenoid is uh, basically sending the water to the plants. and. Uh, the super cup is uh, providing the energy to uh, activate the, the solenoid. At the same time, it's also providing uh, the, the, the power to activate a Bluetooth low energy radio, which is on board. Uh, and this is uh, basically the radio uh, to which we can communicate with the water control system. So we can uh, uh, basically set up programs or see uh, um, basically uh, do the configuration of the system. But every time we turn on and off, uh, of course, uh, um, the, the solenoid uh, also 
the static power needed by the Bluetooth energy radio will discharge the super cup. So the energy in the super cup will decrease time by time. And uh, of course, uh, at a certain point, we need to recover this water. And uh, since we have a system that is monitoring um, the, the energy on the super cup, when the energy uh, is uh, too much decreases, then we activate this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, we activate the, the solenoid at the bottom that will uh, basically uh, activate the harvester and uh, we re recharge and the system will recharge the super cup and uh, we have uh, again energy to restart. So you see here uh, we have uh, the, the we are energizing the system because we have water which is flowing through this harvester and the, the charge in the super cup is increasing. So this system is self-consistent, is set and forget and no maintenance. This is our promise. Uh, on the basis of this, we have now uh, an Italian um, uh, an Italian maker uh, of uh, this product, which is uh, uh, which is already in the market and is providing this uh, the first uh, um, water control system, uh, which can communicate with Bluetooth to energy radio, but is one hundred percent solar energy. It does not have any battery, so it will last forever, basically, because if you don't have a battery to change. is uh, It's always powered through. Through energy, through solar, through solar energy, and is easy to basically ship uh, because it doesn't have uh, batteries on board, and uh, um, is based on super cup and uh, several harvesting system. It will be very soon in the market, probably spring, but you can find already in the in the web. Now, uh, so it's time for my conclusions. So what we are trying to do is uh, to have um, uh, battery free. Uh, solutions for plant conditions monitoring. We want to do predictive maintenance, like in the case of smart irrigations. We want to uh, enable precision farming by disseminating sensors that do not require any maintenance and extra labor, because we understand that uh, farmers don't want to have more information without adding any anything because uh, to their job as they are very busy. We need to be also able to give some simple and set uh, easy to easy to set up because they are not engineers and they don't want to be engineers. So and we want to go beyond precision irrigation, as I said before, and uh, which is uh, basically the smart irrigation. So we now have, as of today, we are able to go to perform precision irrigation. So to basically provide with precision, mechanical precision, the water to the plant but we are not smart enough. So this is possible, and this is possible through low-cost solutions and also commercial available devices. So energy uh, autonomous and battery-free devices are, uh, which uh, allow maintenance-free wire sensor node is possible today, uh, exactly today. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting, exciting presentation. And uh, uh, when uh, when we were listening your talk, uh, we uh, we we means uh, myself and my colleagues, my the coordinator of this uh, of this session, uh, were talking about some application and a couple of questions arise, but. We uh, we decide to keep them for the end of of the conference. Uh, it would be my pleasure to answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's uh, it's time to uh, give the, the the virtual microphone uh, to my colleague uh, Emilio Sardini. No, we we change the position. Okay, good morning uh, to everyone. Now it's uh, time for the third presentation. Uh, the title of this presentation is The Importance of Soil Quality and the Current State of the Art in Soil Quality Sensing Technology. Uh, the 
lecture will be uh, read from Marius uh, uh, Sophocles, uh, that is uh, a technical project manager and the head of hardware at uh, eBoss Technologies. Marius was a special scientist uh, at the University of Cyprus from uh, 2016 until 2022. He obtained his master engineering degree in mechatronics and a PhD degree in sick film and the ground sensor from the University of Southampton in 2011 and 2016, respectively. Marius is a member of the editorial advisory board of most prestigious international journals, such as Sensor and Tweet Ray, and so on. He has published more than uh, 45 journal and conference papers in high impact journals and conference and serves as track chair for IEEE sensor conference and other highly prestigious conference. Marius is also a visiting researcher at Tel Aviv University in the field of biosensor and their electronic instrumentation. Marius, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, Emilio. Thank you for the for the introduction. Um, so my name, as Emilio said, is Marius Sofocleos. I'm a technical project manager and head of the electronics lab at Ebos Technologies Limited. Um, and the presentation today is about the importance of soil quality and the state of the art in sensing technologies of soil quality. I think uh, Roberto and uh, uh, Daniele before they gave a lot of uh, information about what uh, I am planning to say. So I'll, I'll try to focus more on the why instead of giving the technological solutions. Um, so uh, my agenda, I'll just give an introduction of what we actually need to, to understand why we want to improve uh, agricultural efficiency, then explain what soil quality and soil fertility is. What is its purpose in terms of uh, and, and how it's related with uh, plant health and, and plant growth and, and even with uh, crop and, and, and fruit quality and, and quantity that is generated by the plants and then give the, the standards. There are specific standards uh, for the methodologies to be used for uh, assessing the soil quality. I'll just show an overview of what that is and explain the limitations of those standard approaches and then just give a brief overview of what is available in terms of uh, in-field uh, soil quality monitoring technologies. So I think most of this uh, information here on the introduction, most people here, they know since they're interested in this, they already know about it. So the, the, uh, the aim here is to uh, improve the agriculture efficiency because population is growing so we'll need more food and with some trends especially with towards uh, veganism uh, uh, the agricultural production should also increase not just the general uh, food production so based on uh, fao it's great that we have a representative of the fao here uh, 60 percent more food will be needed by 2050. So other than this challenge that we need to increase the production of food, um, in terms of agriculture, we can, of course, expand to more land so we can in increase the agricultural production. But at the same time, the amount of arable land that uh, is available keeps decreasing. If you look into the last 60 years, um, there is a significant decrease in arable land, mostly because of uh, continuous urbanization. So. The only actual option that we currently have is to improve the efficiency of agriculture instead of expanding. Now, the, there is a, 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 it's a big challenge to improve the efficiency without expanding, and there are certain suggestions on, on how to do that. Um, in engineering terms, uh, at least from uh, my perspective, I see this as an optimization problem. So in order to optimize, uh, what we want to have, and I think Roberto mentioned that uh, uh, before, we need to come up with a closed loop feedback system. So we, we need to close that loop. We need to monitor the processes and the parameters that affect 
uh, agricultural uh, procedures, so plant growth, plant health, uh, uh, crop uh, production, crop quality, and all of those things, especially with the rising uh, regulations from the EU on the quality and uh, the information that must be provided to the end user for the for the crops and the fruits, we need to monitor all of those steps from uh, farm to fork. So uh, this optimization problem, in order to be able to achieve that, we need to understand the governing mechanism in all of those processes. And that goes from plant health, from the point that we, pro we, we, we plant the seed, to the point that we grow the plants, to the point that the uh, we, we know what the fertility of the plant, we, we expand to the uh, crop we yield for that plant or the uh, fruit yield, and then the quality uh, of those uh, fruits or crops. Now, there are a lot of approaches for this one. The two uh, main approaches, we need, okay, we can either measure directly on the plant. This is... Uh, uh, it's usually called uh, functional uh, sensing, and this is one way of doing it. There's, uh, well, it's. I would say it's not one way of doing it. It's one thing that we need to do, and additionally, we need to also monitor the parameters, environmental parameters, or any other physical parameters which are indirect factors. And eventually, once we know all of these parameters, we can model or uh, the generate a behavioral model of the of the plant and the production. In that case, you, once we have the uh, the model, then we need to also understand what are the optimization objectives. So what are we optimizing for? If we're optimizing for plant growth, it's a, it might be a different approach. If we're optimizing for a crop yield, it's a different approach. And if we're optimizing for a crop quality or fruit quality, it actually might be a different approach. So, um, other than moving towards precision agriculture and smart agriculture, we need to understand that uh, those optimization parameters might change depending on the actual objective. For example, when you provide, when you plant the seeds, you are more focused on plant growth. So you can optimize from plant growth. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the same optimization values uh, will apply when you're trying to, uh, when the plant grows and you're trying to improve the yield or you're trying to improve the fruit quality. So different objectives might require different optimization points. Now, as I said before, there we have two uh, main uh, directions. You've got the direct sensing directly on the plant. You can monitor uh, plant health. So you can monitor plant nutrition. You can monitor plant growth or even viruses. Uh, you can monitor the quality of the fruits or the uh, of course, you can monitor the quantity, and you can do those with existing technologies directly uh, on the plant or uh, on the on, on the field. I'm pretty sure uh, you can. There are technologies with uh, object recognition and AI now that you can measure and identify whether the fruit is uh, um, is uh, ripe enough to to be collected or not. So. Um, this is for direct sensing. You've got indirect sensing, which involves the environmental parameters. It involves the um, weather conditions. It involves soil sensing. So within these presentations, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the soil sensing part. You've got the soil quality. Within that soil quality, you've got, uh, the, of course, the water supply within the soil which also affects the nutrients. It also affects the, um, of the fungi that you have in the soil. It also affects the biodiversity and the microorganisms available in the, uh, in the soil. So this is one chapter of what needs to be monitored in order to have a complete picture of how to optimize the, the overall system. Okay, soil is, uh, I quote here from a, an old paper, Soil is uh, the world's most vital component for food and fiber production. So soil quality and soil fertility are actually uh, very important and, and very, um, you know, if you want to optimize for this one, you need to take this, this kind of qualities into account. Now, how to assess the soil quality? Uh, soil scientists came up with uh, some soil quality indicators. 
And those uh, indicators, ideally, they should correlate with uh, ecosystem processes. It should integrate uh, the physical, chemical, and biological properties and processes. It should be accessible to many users, be sensitive to management and climate, big components of existing databases in order to be able to know what the optimum value is and be interpretable. Now, these uh, soil quality indicators, they can be separated in three main categories. You've got the chemical, physical, and biological uh, so, uh, SQIs. Each one of these categories, and some of them overlap, of course, but each one of these categories, they relate to a specific soil function. So chemical um, SQIs uh, relate to nutrient cycling, water regulations, and buffering. The physical is mostly uh, related with uh, the stability and support, uh, water relation and retention, essentially, of water in the soil and the habitat. And the biological focuses more on the biodiversity of the microorganisms or um, any other uh, bacteria or earthworms that are um, uh, available in the soil, which can affect the nutrient cycling and uh, filtering. So taking those SQIs uh, separately, when we talk about physical indicators, we're talking about uh, the hydrologic characteristics of the soil. So depending on the packing, for example, in that soil, the particle size of the soil, depending on the, um, the, the, the pressure, essentially, that can be uh, applied to, that, uh, to the soil, different sizes, particle sizes of the soil can provide different hydrological properties, and those can affect how much water can uh, the soil maintain and for how long which also affects what is available for the plant roots to uptake. Uh, of course, if, if this applies to water, since most of the nutrients uh, reach the, uh, the plant roots through the water, then it also affects the nutrient availability. Uh, also, it affects how easily the roots of the plant can grow and, and move, create a path within the soil. And it also affects the, the erosional status, uh, which... Um, well, during raining, it, it can uh, uh, wash away some of the soil uh, and, and can have a, a really devastating effect on the plant itself. So some parameters, some physical parameters are actually used for this uh, SQIs. The physical SQIs are, are the aggregate stability, available water capacity, bulk density, infiltration, slugging, soil crust, and soil structure and micropores. Uh, moving on with the chemical indicators, in this case, the chemical content, of course, uh, will set the equilibrium between uh, soil solutions, so the water in the soil and the nutrients, and based uh, in, com in combination with the physical parameters can uh, define what are the exchange sites and uh, how the roots can uh, uptake whatever nutrients are uh, inside the, in the soil. It also affects the plant health. The nutritional requirements of the of the plant and soil animal communities. So soil animal communities, I'm talking about the biological uh, SQIs, so microorganisms within the soil, because they are also uh, responsible for initiating and uh, continuing the processes that uh, are needed for the plant roots to uptake some of the of the nutrients. Also, the chemical content in terms of pollution, it can also affect the the plant health. So these uh, indicators are mostly focusing on electrical conductivity, nutrient concentrations of NPK, micronutrient concentrations. Uh, of course, not if this is not limited to uh, sodium, calcium, magnesium, it's just that these are some of the important ones. Iron, for example, is another one. Zinc is another one. Depending on the plant, you get different micronutrient uh, uh, importance for each one, and also the, the soil pH. Uh, finally, the biological indicators uh, are uh, the essentially describe the capability of soil to uh, initiate those biological processes. So there are some earthworms, there are some bacteria that uh, they generate, uh, they process some of the nutrients, they translate them to a different form in a form that the plant roots can actually take uh, that, um, uh, that nutrient and, and grow. So the number of uh, those uh, organisms in the in the soil is, is important and the diversity of them. So having a, a huge number of one type of bacteria, for example, and no uh, 
um, having nothing on or from another type, it, it, it can uh, have a really uh, uh, unexpected results on the plant health. So a balance is actually required in that in that case. So some uh, uh, indicators uh, involve the amount of earthworms, the particulate organic matter, potentially mineralizable nitrogen, respiration, soil enzymes, and the total organic carbon. Okay, so these are the parameters that are actually used to assess the soil quality and the fertility of the soil. But how can these actually relate with uh, plant health and growth? And how what is what what are we really missing here? Why do we need to monitor these uh, uh, these SQIs in the uh, in the soil? What do we what I think at this stage that we're missing is to relate those um, uh, those parameters with what output of the plant is. So we need to take it step by step first and see, okay, I have these kind of parameters. This has translated to something that the plant can take. And uh, then the, the mechanism that is running inside the plant will um, initiate the next stage and then the next stage. However, what do, what is currently being done and what has been done in the past was just to say, okay, let's use this amount of fertilizer for this other size of a plant and let's uh, fertilize it twice a year during this period. Okay, that obviously moving towards precision agriculture, smart agriculture is not really uh, smart. So the new approach, the conventional approach currently is to monitor those SQIs um, and ensure that they are, they are maintained at a certain level. However, what this misses to understand is that different timings, the whole uh, approach of precision nutrition and the precision agriculture is also time dependent. So the optimization that we would need to do, uh, as I explained before, it's uh, for different objectives. So if you're talking about plant growth, then you're talking about a different optimization in terms of time. So you might need to fertilize during the night, for example, or water during the night if you want the plant to give you better crops, or you want to fertilize or water during the day if you want the plant to grow faster. So these are just some things that we need to understand and find a way to monitor, which is not currently the case. We, we don't really need, we don't really have the technology to move in this direction. Okay, so the conventional ways of monitoring those SQIs is uh, essentially using soil sampling. Um, soil sampling is a is a standard approach of the, of uh, assessing so soil quality indicators. So you you have to go out in the field. You have to take a specific sample from a specific location in a specific time. Uh, take that sample uh, back to the lab in a specific way, following a specific standard. And then perform some wet, wet chemistry analysis on that uh, on that sample. However, these steps are um, uh, are very sensitive. So if something happens in between uh, for soil sampling until the time that you do the chemical testing, uh, the the results that you can you will get will probably not be representative of what uh, uh, what was actually the case. So. Other than the fact that the whole uh, the whole soil sampling approach it doesn't give you continuous measurements it will only uh, it requires uh, just to show what the actual uh, procedure is you need to uh, go out in the field take a sample you need to uh, store the sample in a specific way you need to transfer that uh, uh, sample to to the lab you need to uh, provide a specific amount in a specific volume. Uh, of soil, a specific amount of chemicals to run the tests, and you can interpret then the results. But this um, this approach and this methodology has uh, uh, sorry so has significant uh, limitations. There are other approaches that as you can see here, uh, but these most of these approaches that are available now they cannot give you any chemical or biological content. So any SQIs that are relevant to uh, uh, the chemical and biological uh, categories are not really uh, av av available to be monitored in the field. Um, so what uh, 
what are the limitations of these approaches that you essentially you need someone that is an expert in uh, soil sampling and and, and uh, soil quality uh, assessing soil quality to go out in the field for a, at a specific time uh, specific point in time and you need to take measurements uh, at a specific location which means that if you have deviations between different locations within the same field you will need to take multiple samples and if you want this to be um, uh, at a high density uh, sampling in terms of time then you have to go outside in the field and take samples uh, at a you know very often which it's of course labor intensive it takes a lot of uh, time it's sensitive and complex it does not allow someone like a farmer to actually do this uh, these procedures so what do we what is actually uh, what we really need to uh, come up with from the technology perspective is to uh, find and develop solutions that can continuously provide um, feedback on those SQIs directly in the soil. This, at this stage, there are only a very few uh, techniques that uh, they can do that uh, directly, and there are very few technologies available that can uh, achieve that, well, at least partially achieve what we're looking for. Um, one approach for the uh, that is actually being used right now is the soil uh, you know, soil sampling kits. So there are some kits with specific uh, chemicals and uh, tools that you can take with you in the field. You can take samples in the field, perform all those procedures directly in the field, and you can get the uh, quality indicators on yourself. But at least that requires, again, a well-trained personnel, requires someone to go there and does not provide continuous uh, data, which if I try to refer back to the original problem, if we want to make this precision agriculture time dependent and the optimization problem to be time dependent, then this approach doesn't really uh, provide enough information to allow for that. Um, of course, there are other sensors that can be used and have been used in the past, which can provide some uh, continuous measurements, but uh, they are, I mean, I, I can explain the categories you've got the electromagnetic sensors you've got time domain reflectometry frequency domain reflectometry you've got ground penetrating radar or open-ended waveguides within this um, within this category most of the sensors are actually operating to monitor the dielectric constant of soil so uh, the electromagnetic part of uh, of the soil is being uh, used as the sensing parameter and then that can be related to other parameters like soil water content or electrical conductivity. Of course, there are other radioactive techniques, the neutron probes or gamma ray attenuation. You've got infrared, infrared spectroscopy, X-ray, fluorescence spectrometry, fluorometry, and uh, other machine uh, learning vision systems and remote sensing technology. Remote sensing technology is something that does actually uh, being used. It is being used at the moment. Um, you They take images using satellites you can have spectral images, so you can choose the, the frequency that you want to, to use to analyze um, a huge amount, a huge area, actually, that from uh, like uh, using a single picture, you can get information about a huge area, but at the same time, that can only give you whatever is on the surface. So if we take into account the, the XYZ uh, approach, then the satellite imaging can only give you XYZ. There is no... Uh, there's no information about that. And again, in, in respect of the four parameter with time, they, you can only get images as long as the uh, satellites are at the, at the right position to get the images for the field of interest. So in reality, none of these techniques is really in real time and really standalone that you can put the sensor, as Robert said before, uh, to set and forget. Um, Although the instrumentation, as Roberto said before, it's available, so I can connect the sensor to the instrumentation and send the data, um, the actual sensor itself to monitor these parameters in the soil does, uh, doesn't really exist. What we currently have and they're available uh, are some um, sensors monitoring soil impedance. Those sensors can give you essentially the temperature 
So because impedance is temperature dependent, and from that impedance, it can give you uh, soil water content, can give you electrical conductivity, which relates to salinity and other soil parameters, at least. Uh, this is what is actually available. There are several ranges of uh, technologies available. For example, there are some um, technologies that are expensive, but uh, they are more reliable, but they're more expensive. So it comes in with a trade of how many of those sensors can I actually deploy. Um, you can go to much cheaper sensors, but they're not reliable. You can go somewhere in between uh, with having other issues like lifetime. There are actually uh, other sensors that claim to measure NPK concentrations, which is, uh, uh, I mean, what the, what is actually being done within those sensors is to monitor the impedance and based on the impedance and some correlations that of, of that specific soil, they can correlate that if the impedance because of salinity and electrical conductivity, if we know that this is the impedance, uh, then I can uh, correlate it with the actual nutrient concentration. So. This is how it, it's providing it. It does not specifically measure the parameter of interest, but it correlates with that. However, if you have, uh, let's say if I fertilize a specific type of nutrient, then the sensor will not know it. It will just give you that, okay, it has a higher uh, NPK concentration. It doesn't, doesn't know specifically, it's not specific enough to understand that you added this type of, uh, of nutrient. So just to conclude, um, of course, as explained, uh, there is a, an increasing requirement for a significant increase in agricultural production. Because of the decrease in arable land, we require a huge increase in uh, agricultural efficiency. And that requires uh, uh, the optimization of specific parameters and specific objectives. But in order to do that, we need to understand uh, the governing mechanisms that affect all uh, parameters, both environmental and weather and soil and the plant itself uh, in order, and, and try to move from um, the static approach of uh, soil quality indicators to time dependent optimization. Uh, uh, conventional techniques for monitoring those SQIs require soil sampling. Uh, there are several limitations as explained before. So the current state of the art does not allow to monitor those soil uh, parameters, at least not all of them directly in the soil. So this, is uh, a message to us the engineers that we need to uh, uh, identify and develop new sensing technologies that can monitor soil quality indicators directly in the soil involving both the chemical and the biological sensor. Thank you. This is it from my side. Thank you, Marcus, for your interesting lecture. For the description uh, you made about uh, uh, the requirement uh, and uh, the proposition of some solution and the uh, analysis you made about uh, uh, the characteristic of the solution uh, we can have uh, and your conclusion about the necessity to have uh, more sensors that are able to measure possibly continuously um, data information. Uh, we can have time for the question during the discussion. So, yes. uh, hoping uh, to have some question from uh, the, 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 the public, uh, we, we can have uh, the discussion uh, uh, just uh, uh, in, in, at 12. Uh, now, uh, we are going to the last uh, lecture, uh, whose title is Bioconverse and Biosensing for Agriculture and Food Application. Um, the uh, speaker is uh, Yosi uh, from uh, University, uh, from Tel Aviv University. Uh, Yossi is uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, head of the Institute for Synthetic Biology at Reichmann University and the Bernard Schultz Chair for Nanoscale Information Technology, Tel Aviv University. 
is, is also a chief professor at the Tapper uh, Institute for Engineering Technology, uh, India, and international director of the TAU, uh, TIET Food Security Center of Excellence uh, Director. Please, uh, yours, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will talk today. Let me just check the time so we will be in time. Good. Uh, today I will talk about bioconvergence in biosensing for agriculture and food applications. First, you know, as an introduction, let's understand what I'm talking about. What, what, is, bio, what is convergence? Convergence, you all know, if we look at the Webster, uh, Webster Dictionary, is the act, fact, and condition of converging. So we use the term converging for the definition of convergence. And in biology, the formation of similarities in unrelated organisms. So converging, things are getting together. So what is getting together? This term uh, was emerged about 20 years ago. It has different name, but the idea, and many of the ideas came from the Kurzweil Institute, or Kurzweil AI.net. Uh, for example, the Charles Ostman, a senior fellow wrote uh, that I'm, I'm quoting him, advances in genetic engineering, computational processes, nanobio, biometaphors in computing, leading to bioconvergence that will reshape the economics of the world. Practically, what happens is when engineering meets life sciences. Uh, Rocco and Benbridge from the NSF uh, wrote, uh, stated that converging technology integrated from the nanoscale could determine a tremendous improvement in human abilities and social outcomes. I will make it short. NSF recognized that bioconvergence is a major trust for everybody. And there are four, there are five vectors in bioconvergence. One of them was the human genome mapping, and which led to genome pharmaceutics, recombinant proteomics, and a lot of other things. Second one was all the effort in nanobiotechnology. And the technology becomes more available and cost-effective. And bioengineering of crops became a very important issue. We can bioengineer crops, livestock, and an ecological system to make them uh, more uh, suitable for the change in environment, change in the change. In, the, weather, the weather is not going, the, the climate is not only changing, it's also the variation in the climate become more and more radical. So you, you need to, ma to make crops, livestock to, more, to be more uh, resilient, more stable under changing conditions. We're all familiar with the cross convergence in micro scale fabrication technologies and biological materials, computing. This is when information technology, bioinformatics, AI, uh, artificial life, all of them uh, integrated with telecommunication infrastructure is everything. I modified it from the paper by Charles Ostman. I just added, for example, the last term, which after working on bioconvergence for some time, I figured out that you have also to take into consideration economical issues, political, ethics, and psychology, social media, and more. If you introduce new technology, especially today without, uh, you need sometimes to overcome some public opinion, fear. Uh, if, if you don't overcome it, people will not, you can, you can develop the best technology, but if people will not use it, it's worthless. So we need to talk, in our institute in India, we introduce people from economy, political sciences together, working on technologies uh, when we develop new technologies. So what is the output of bioconvergence? You can engineer organisms. You can in introduce new therapeutics and diagnostics. You can look at bio-based material production. You can use microbes, yeast, uh, other, other organisms to develop new materials for you. And for example, people talk about DNA data storage, and you can see the name of the company that published it. But this is an interesting concept, using DNA and RNA as a digital, uh, as a digital engine, so as a digital component, so you can use storage. And to, today, I'm going to show you what we do with digital computing using plants. Just to impress you a little bit, uh, McKinsey published in 2020 a report about the biorevolution report. 
and that dissipate and in the next 20 years, this will be a $4 trillion industry. As an example, 60% of the world's physical input could be made by bio means. 45% of the world's disease burden could be addressed, I mean, not solved, but addressed. And 30% of private sector R&D spent on bio-related industries. So it's going to be a lot of funding. In Israel, we have the Bioconvergence Initiative where the government allocated about $1, million, $1 billion, sorry. <laughs> it's a small difference. $1 billion uh, for developing bioconvergence infrastructure in Israel for the next five years. In summarize, you know, in engineering, we like Venn diagrams. So we, if we have information communication technology and we have micro and nanotechnology and we have biotechnology, all of them merge together to what we call next generation technology opportunities or bioconvergence. So, what we have on the plate, we have nature inspired from fabrication, bio inspired materials, DNA digital data storage, energy osmosis, computer simulating the human brain, swarm logic, and energy grids. What else can we have using micro and nano engineering for biotechnology? We can have biochips, artificial cells, tissues on a chip, microorgans, and smart implants. And today I will talk a little bit about biochips because when I'm going to talk about bioconvergence for agriculture, biochips, either for sensors or for actuators, integrated with CMOS for communication, part of the sensing will be part of the effort for using bioconvergence for agriculture and food. So to be more specific, we talk about synthetic biology. This talk today is a little bit about synthetic biology, which is a subset of bioconvergence. In synthetic biology, we use engineering concepts to solve biological problems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. Bioelectronics, smart materials, I already said it, biocomputing and biosensing. I focus in my group, in my research, we focus more on biosensing using synthetic biology and bioelectronics, which is going to be the main, uh, main issue of the talk today. But as you can imagine, it's uh, the, from what I'm going to show you today, you can also, you can also uh, think or make other things. So if we talk about the uh, engineering biotechnology hybrids for new paradigms, you can think about biorobotics, cyborgs, man-machine, animal-machine interface, and maybe a combination of machine man animal working together uh, you can think, I should also put a uh, man machine plant because we are at the presentation today. I'm going to show you how we interface plants. So if we summarize, we talk about biotechnology and bioconvergence and synthetic biology. So actually we have biotechnology. Biotechnology is the exploitation of biological processes for industrial and other purposes, especially the genetic manipulation of microorganisms for the production of antibiotics hormones. But we can also use it to make a cultivated meat to solve the problem of food. You can also make it use it to make sensors and we can use it to other things. And it's synthetic. It's synthetic, synthetic uh, the official definition of synthetic is something which is made by chemical synthesis. But practically everything made by synthesis is synthetic, like synthetic rubber. But the, by the way, just as a, Curiosity, there's another people who make logic design use the work synthesis to describe what to do. It's a little irrelevant to this discussion. So, we talk about synthetic biology, which is a field of science that involves redesigning organisms for useful purposes and by engineering them to have new capabilities. Let me give you an example. When you design a computer or design VLSI design, you have a physical layer, gates, modules computers and networks. Now let's see about biology design. Why not in the physical layer will be the proteins and the genes. The gates are the, bio the biochemical reactions or the, and then we if you think about the models is what we call pathways, we have a combination of biological reactions that perform a, a certain task. If we talk about computers, which are units which are making computation, cells are units that make computation. And they all make networks 
which are tissue sculptures which are making the organism. So if we if we need to design some pathway or design some tissue or design some pharmaceutics, why not using the VLSI design or the circuit design concept that we go from the bottom and we make like we can use software like Cadence or Synopsis or some other software, but why not designing biological reactions? Because one of the problems with biology, it's a very complex. You have tens of thousands of genes and you have uh, hundreds of thousands of proteins and they can change. So if we need some, uh, what we call uh, electronic design tools, electro uh, uh, or card, or computer aided design. So we should, when we design biology, uh, one of the thrusts today, this is a Professor Ron Weiss from MIT that published a lot of work on this field. Why not using uh, electronic concepts when you design biology? So if we summarize a little bit, uh, I took it from this paper that was published two years ago. Overall, synthetic biology can be used for many things. You can use it to enhance nutritional value. You can use it to synthetic metabolic engineering. You can use it to stress tolerance in plant, in plant to improve their biotic, if they have a biotic or abiotic stress, you can improve their response to stress. And this is extremely important for agriculture in uh, like in the Mediterranean, when we have a, a strong, we have a very big difference between summer and winter and then fall and spring. So, and the, it's going to be more radical. We, we have heavy rains now in summer and winter become different. So we need plants that can be more resilient. And the last one, which is the main part of the talk today is plants as biosensors. And we, I'm going to show you an approach where we look at the biosensor in plant, we use what we call synthetic gene circuits. And the name circuits was chosen specifically because we treat it as electronic circuits. And we have inputs, we have outputs, and we analyze it in a similar way that we analyze electronic circuits. Just as a comment, I'm an electrical engineer uh, with a PhD in engineering from the Technion. So I was trained as engineer, although in the last 20 years, I work also in biology. But my approach is to look at biology and try to figure out, can we use engineering concept to solve or understand biological problems? So if I talk about synthetic biology sensors, they have two parts. One is the biology part. In the synthetic biology genomics, metabolic engineering, or maybe a new material. But the second part is the engineering part. You want to integrate the sensor with the real world. So you can use microfluidics. We use a lot of electrochemical sensors and optical sensors. How do you sample the data? How do you sample the fluid? How do you sample the information? And if you're using it for wearable technology, and a lot of our sensors are practically wearable, when we put the sensor and people talk to them about Internet of Things, if you put the sensor on a tree or on a tomato or, or some another plant, you can also deal with all the problems with wearable. So if you want to design synthetic biology sensor, you need to know biology. And you need to know all these micro MEMS, microfluidic, and, and electronic engineering technology, which is very difficult as a professor in the university. I would say it's difficult to train students to know everything. So, in my group, we have students from engineering learning biology and students from biology learning engineering, but we need both. Just to show you a, a project that we have in Israel, and I'm the kind of uh, one of this was. Uh, one of the leaders of this project, I'm acting as the head of the uh, scientific committee, or what we can call it the chief technology officer of this national project to design a biochip that can have the biology part interface with transducer, interface uh, preprocesses, analog, what you call analog interface. We work on like a uh, sub-threshold, amplifiers, sampling units, because most of the electronics today was not originally designed for biology. And sometimes there are, there are not enough channels, 
and the bandwidth is too much and the power is too much. We are now designing with a, a, a real semiconductor companies, a dedicated electronics to deal with biosensors, with data fusion and process communication units, and also cloud interface, and also even data uh, digital right management interface, and of course, cybersecurity in every level. So we want to make the life of hackers very difficult. So this is a project that we do in Israel. Hey, we are halfway through it, and I hope that making, we already have a you say, tape out of the system. And hopefully we can show you some next year in one of the major projects and this, uh, this concept working. I took the same slide as the previous. I think we took it from the same paper. Uh, after giving the long introduction, I owe you uh, some explanation. How do you make sensors to make plant stress using bioconvergence? And again, the convergence of technology enabled engineers to work with computing, analysis, and genetics, and our teams are working together uh, on this type of biosensors using bioconvergence, where we working, electronic engineers are working side by side with biologists to develop these systems. And one of the reasons it became available about a few years ago in 2020 is that all this technology of data, computing, artificial intelligence, material science progress in the 20th century to a level that we can do it now. At the same time, all this like technology of chemical herbicide, biological drugs, the digitization of biological data and genetic editing became mature enough so we could integrate everything together. Everything is biotechnology and software and electrical and other engineering are now becoming one unit and the end is technology that you can, we like very much in our project in India, we develop a kind of cell phone based interface that can take the sensor information and send it to the cloud, sensing water, pesticide, and the farmers like it if we present it in the right way. Current technology is actually pretty good. We have a, what we call a sensor that we put in the soil. We can measure light, humidity, temperature, soil moisture, fertilizers, and by no means what I'm going to show you next is going to replace it. It's going, my technology I'm going to show you, which is called bioconverging technology, is going to work hand in hand with a conventional technology. We cannot replace it. What we have today, we have ex vivo sensors. That those are commercially available sensors. You stick them on the ground, you put them on, you stick them next to the plants, and you get the measurement, you get the information. There are a lot of these uh, te technologies emerging in the market. It's pretty random, and I, I was I, I listened to the previous two talk, previous three talks, and I, it was actually absolutely fascinating talks because. It shows that there's a lot of things to do. And, and actually, the one of the issues, and I, for example, the talk from ST Micro, which I liked very much, is they need to have some standardization. They need to have some common thing. But one of the problems with this type of sensors is that if you don't, if, if you measure, uh, you're measuring in the soil, but actually your customer is the plant. So we need to measure in the soil because there is a direct relation, but can we measure in the plant? So this is what we do. We measure, we use the plant as a sensor. Uh, this is a tomato plants that we genetically modified to give response to heat, drought and pathogens. We already have this in stock. And then if the plant is uh, thirsty, it sends a signal to an electrode component and I can see that the, the plant is thirsty. And I can see the response of the plant a few minutes after it becomes thirsty. But all other methods of sensing in plants usually take, in the good case, a few hours, sometimes few days. It's like yourself. When you're thirsty, you're thirsty. You don't need the sensor sticking into your body. You know you're sensing because of the biological sensors inside your body. And very important to detect pathogens. And recently, we succeeded to demonstrate the detecting of pathogens is the same concept. The other thing I would like to stress today, we would like to make this concept 
as versatile as possible. It's like software writing. We, it's a one process that we have a reporter gene, which are, is, uh, they are responding by signal transduction to some analyte. They generate mRNA, messenger RNA, we generate the reporter. So by changing the promoter element, I can tune my sensor to whatever I need. The reporter is the same, mRNA is the same, the reporter proteins is the same. So I'm just changing the promoter element, which is actually much, you can do it in the plants in three months for any new type of sensor you want to detect. Now there are two possibilities for sensor. One possibility is to make uh, your sensing component affecting the DNA. And I'm going to talk later about a new concept that we actually like very much. Uh, this is our main research because we work on DNA-based sensor for 20 years. But RNA-based sensors, I can actually control the RNA using uh, sensing. And the advantage is RNA lasts for a few, few minutes. So if the signal appears, DNA can continue to generate a signal for days. But if I affect the RNA, I got the signal in a few minutes, and then the RNA stops working. And so I, I can, then the sensor is ready for the next signal. So the uh, DNA-based sensors are like this, uh, that we have a sensing element, which is uh, based on a constitutive promoter. Constitutive promoter is a promoter that keeps uh, generating, keep expressing. But here I have a repressor that this, it does not connect to the reporter. So one option is that we have the analyte touching the repressor, then the reporter gene starts to operate. And you can think it as a gate that uh, we have one here and a signal here. So I got the a signal output only when I got one and one here. So practically, and I can put this uh, path on the DNA, I can put it on the RNA. And we like to put it on the RNA because if we, in the RNA, we have this RNA loops, and this is a protein. And this protein, if it's not touching the gene, then I have expression. But if the protein is touching this, this is part of the CRISPR the proteins. And if this protein touches the RNA, then there is no expression. So Cas6 is a core component in the IE CRISPR complex. It binds to and cleaves pre-CRNA the uh, RNA by recognizing a specific stem loop Element. So I can control the expression by this protein. And there's another issue. If I express a protein, the protein itself can last for a long time. So what we do, we take the expression of the, for example, if you want to express GFP, which is a green fluorescent protein, it's usually a very stable expression. But if I put another component, which is called a proline glutamate serine, uh, throwing in or pest sequence, then the protein become unstable. And this is an example that we took two uh, reporters, one red, one green. The green, we make it unstable. So after 24 hours of expression, the green and the red responded. But after 36 hours, the, the green disappeared. We still need to make it better, but we can, what we do, this is a intensity versus time. And you can see that GFP was passed after two days, practically, we go back to the baseline. So one of the problems in making real sensors is you want them to be ready for the next signal. So you want to make the system on one hand to respond. On the other hand, you want, when there is no signal, there is no output. So you want to, the proteins to be unstable and you want the RNA to disappear. So we can make a NOT gate. This is a very simple circuit. We have, uh, for example, we designed this. This is a plant cell, a tomato cell, that can detect estradiol, which is a mammalian estrogenic steroid, which is used in uh, for this uh, purpose. So we can make a plant detect human uh, hormones. And we have a purpose because we are working on not only on food and agriculture, we want to see can plants can be used plants for developing drugs, which is a new business, which is uh, one of the problems that if we can make plants making drugs, 
because they are they are living things. We can save a lot of animals, and maybe we can make it more effective. So this is example that they start the old induction uh, affect the cas six, and if the cas six uh, in this case uh, stops the repressor, we have a change in the signal in the up. So this is a, a signal. This is what happens if you remember this is this is a repressor signal. So if there is no uh, hormone, we get light. If there is a hormone, we stop to, we stop the production of light. And this is kind of a diagram, but I think it's much better. You, you see the image. It's very convincing that we have a response. The this, the leaf of this plant is responding to uh, human hormones. And we can make, this is a sensor. This is a sensor made by bioconvergence. We can even make two loops here and we make a north circuit. So we, we can, here we have two inputs and we have uh, EC cast, CD cast. Each one is re responding to a different chemical. So we can, for example, we demonstrate recently a sensor which is a north detecting uh, ethanol and hormones. And we did it as an exercise, but you can think that you can detect more than one sensor. So it's practically a NOR circuit. And this is a NOR gate. This is NOR exposure. When response to ethanol, no light. Response to thrusher, no light. Surprisingly, when we expose to both of them, we got a little bit of light, but this one, we don't understand why. And this to show you that the analogy between genetic circuits to electrical circuits is not 100% understood yet. And we have some side effects that we don't understand, but at least we got the progress. The last thing I'm going to show you today in the next five minutes is the lactate sensor. Lactate is a metabolite which is used in the body. I'm going to show you that we can do more things using the same concept. For example, we can do a, transgenic structures like taking bacterial trans trans transcription factor with lactate recognition motif here and a bind DNA binding. And we can take a, trans a transcription activation domain from this plant, Arabidopsis italiana. And if we bond them together, we make artificial transcription element. So this is a lactate sensor that you remember, the, the Cas6 is a protein that caused the blockage here. So if we have the binding protein here, uh, releasing the Cas6, we don't have a signal. But when the lactate is coming, lactate uh, uh, co connects to this uh, protein, and then it stops the binding. Then there's no expression of Cas6, and there we got the signal. It looks complicated, but it actually makes sense. Because if you use only the transcription factor, we see this is the, this is testing of the, of the uh, synthetic transcription factor to convince you that uh, if we don't have it, we don't have a signal. If we have it, we can express uh, general fluorescent protein. So the the, the synthetic trans transcription factor actually works, and we can test it with lactate. So if no no lact lactic acid is working because there's no nothing blocks it. But if we put uh, lactic acid, we don't have a signal. So this is kind of a negative signal, but if we put it in the previous construction, that when we don't have lactate, uh, we, we have the binding, and then we don't have a signal, but when we have the lactate, the whole construct stops the binding to the DNA, and then we start to get expression, and then it becomes even much more sensitive, and this is a positive response. We can even do more complicated things. And this, this is a, the next, we can, for example, put two type of circuits here. This is like a, a, using a positive feedback because if you remember the loop expression here generates, a, generates CS, CS14 is a protein similar to Cas6. It has the same effect on loops. So if we have a signal here, usually we got some expression and we got some, some response. But then we have another Cas6, which affects this protein, it affects this one, which affects the... Uh, so we have kind of a positive feedback. And we, if you do this, you see that the off state is much more stable. 
and the on state is much more stable. And once we get the signal, we get spontaneous reaction and we got, it's like a, it's, it's not exactly B state system. And we still try to figure the electronic model for it. But if you remember the CAS 6, when it's not touching, we have a signal. And when it's touching, there's no signal. So this is bioconvergence to biosensors. This is the effort that we do now. And we are now doing field experiments to show how we can do it. And thanks to my team, I work with Professor Adi Avni that I think you, some of you know him. We actually work together, he's in life science. This is uh, students Yuval, Tali, Akash, and this all the bio team, which is much more. And we collaborate with Professor Robbins, Daniel from the Technion, Danilo, which, which you all know, and Professor Aloni and Maya Barr from the Vulcani Institute, which is very helpful to, our, helpful to us. And I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Josef, for your interesting uh, presentation. Um, the uh, consideration about uh, uh, electronics and uh, biology, the uh, discussion about uh, uh, the possibility to use uh, classification of electronic components to apply to the biological field. And uh, so I, I, I think that uh, in, in, in the next uh, round table, uh, a question about uh, the possibility to obtain a by computer uh, should be <laughs> uh, posed to your attention. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, before uh, to uh, begin the round table, uh, we can have uh, uh, just five minutes uh, of break, uh, just uh, to, 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 to make a break between the keynote lectures and the round table. Uh, so uh, if you want to take a coffee and uh, so the possibility to have a discussion uh, in, in the next uh, uh, minutes, uh, we will uh, uh, see again here just at uh, 12 uh, and 5 uh, minutes. Uh, okay. Okay. See you at 12 and, and 5. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> We are ready to for, for, for the round table. So just let me check. Let me check for this. Uh, for uh, these uh, interesting lectures, uh, we have uh, uh, some question uh, to the, the speaker. And uh, uh, for example, uh, um, Roberto, for uh, uh, what concerns uh, the energy harvesting, the possibility uh, to supply uh, the sensor, you use a lot of sensor that uh, you disseminate uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, you use uh, light, for example, uh, also, uh, the flow of water, very interesting, very interesting. Do you think that uh, we can use uh, also other different quantities, such as, uh, for example, heat? Micro. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Of course, indeed. Uh, as I said, uh, the system is agnostic from the power point of uh, power source point of view. Uh, therefore, uh, we provide an example with uh, a photovoltaic cell because it's widespread and very easy to use. We have light everywhere, but uh, we, as, as I showed, we can also use a plant microbial fuel cell. We can use vibrational uh, thermoelectric generators. So any kind of uh, uh, harvesters, and we can yet perform um, uh, or yet use uh, uh, the transducer uh, simultaneously as a power source and a, a sensor. Uh, in the specific case of using a thermoelectric generator, for instance, 
we call the uh, indirectly measure the temperature difference between uh, the cold and uh, the, uh, the hot uh, terminals. Uh, so from our point of view, it's uh, quite agnostic and uh, it can be used. Thank you. And uh, uh, th there was also another uh, interesting proposition, the cork with the capacitor, uh, printed with the printed capacitor. Uh, yeah. This, uh, how, how you use it? Uh, printing uh, a machine to put some uh, conductive film to obtain the... Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I must say, I forgot to say that this is a, a beautiful research that is performed by Daniela Jacopino from uh, Tyndall uh, Research Center in Cork, Ireland. Uh, they have a process that uh, they have in place where they use a laser. Uh, they basically burn, I mean, for what I understood, they burn at the surface of the cork with the laser and they create these tracks and the in, in the inner fingers of uh, uh, these trucks, they have a uh, capacitance. And uh, it's a published article, uh, very, very interesting article. And I know personally Daniela, so we are sharing these results. And I believe this is a, a good example of the way to follow if we want to do something uh, which is uh, uh, eco-compatible. And uh, we also foresee the possibility um, to have uh, when we have to trash all these electronics, all this stuff, uh, how to do that? I agree perfectly with you. The possibility to have uh, uh, an, uh, an an ecosystem that they use uh, um, electronics uh, using natural element uh, to obtain a component uh, uh, for uh, sensing uh, operation and so on for what needed to the electronic component uh, to acquire the data and the sender. Uh, I I think that uh, uh, printing a printer uh, could uh, uh, have uh, a role uh, in this opportunity. Uh, since uh, you can integrate uh, uh, materials, uh, the material typical of electronics, uh, uh, such as uh, to obtain the component uh, uh, required to uh, have an electronic circuit uh, sensor and uh, and so on. So I think that uh, uh, it should be the, the, the future, uh, a great possibility to integrate uh, into Do your opinion. Uh, I fully agree on that, and this is exactly uh, the 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 way we are following. Uh, we are also paving, um, and in in this really moment, we are also uh, trying uh, to integrate uh, antennas. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the lower antennas into uh, a substrate uh, like this, for instance. So if we can put everything, this is a APT substrate where. You see, there's a printed the photovoltaic cell. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to see. Uh, uh, that uh, in the future could be paper or cork or uh, whatever is the material that is more eco compatible. In this moment, it's PET. And we are trying to put uh, on this substrate, to actually to print on this substrate, the photovoltaic cell, an organic photovoltaic cell, the antenna, and eventually also uh, uh, the capacitor. So anything which is beyond the silicon, we are trying to um, uh, print in this kind of materials. Uh, it's uh, it's convenient because uh, first of all, um, pragmatically, it, it reduces the cost a lot. And the costs, as I said, is a, 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 a real challenge that we need uh, uh, to face. If we want to put uh, this sensor, uh, to bring this sensor in a thousand, a million or trillions of sensors. So cost is important, uh, especially in agri-food, where the, the numbers that we or not, or sensors that we are going to install is very high. So the initial investment must be uh, consistent, is, it must be uh, contained. Otherwise, the, there will be a psychological break from uh, the farmers uh, to begin with. So any penny counts when uh, the number of sensors to install uh, is important. So we are going to this way of printing materials for two reasons, eco-compatibility, but also because it's convenient. It's convenient. Uh, we don't hide the fact that it's convenient from, it is the 
is the, the most practical way to reduce costs. Thank you, Roberto, for your consideration. Maurizio, do you have some questions? Thank you very much to you. Thank you. It's not really a question, actually, a sort of comment. Um, if Yosi is around, yes. yes. Uh, you were talking about bioconvergence. And in fact, an example of bioconvergence is what do you see? What is in front of your eyes? It is myself. I'm a pharmacologist. Emilio is an engineering. And Emanuela is a plant pathologist. So is an example on, of uh, 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 a way a way to uh, uh, contaminate different kind of experience. And since I'm listening and I'm following this uh, this uh, conference with the bias, my bias is uh, think about the humans. You know? And you were talking, you all were talking about data, about information, information on the plant health. Uh, my connection is thinking about information about human, single, individual health. What I haven't heard is a term, a word that is privacy. There is a sort of protection of this information that are dealing with the health status of a living organism. That's it. Was it a question or a statement? No, it's a boss, <laughs> boss, <laughs> boss. <laughs> um, I have you know your comment on this. Now, having you sitting on the same table, you are a good example of bio of convergence. <laughs> I, for example, I just moved to be a faculty member in the Faculty of Medicine. So I moved from engineering faculty to the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, you raised, I think what you raised is something very fundamental. Uh, because we are dealing with living, living things, can be mammalian, can be human, we are mammals, so we have to talk about humans, animals, plants, and there's the information. You asked about the safety about this information, about how to see, how to protect it. Yeah, we are we are we, we take it very seriously because uh, I believe that uh, the project that I'm leading that. Uh, uh, cybersecurity and data protection should be one of the first and most important, it's not enough to develop all these fancy circuits and to detect this and to see this. And this information is extremely valuable. It has to be not only protected and be used wisely. So, and I think uh, in order, my, my personal opinion, that we have to be involved on all this project, people from Faculty of Medicine and Ethical Science and even, not don't give it only to engineers to lead this effort. This is my, my with all my due respect to engineers, and I'm engineer, and my best friends are engineers. We need people from the Faculty of Medicine, including uh, we have the Department for Pharmaceutical, but it's part of the medical school. It's extremely important to have them involved and to design what is needed, how is needed, how is it protected, what level. Because if you protect it too much, you cannot use it. If you don't protect it, so who is it, who is eligible to use it? It's a big issue. And yet it has to, to my opinion, it has to be built in the electronics. So when ST is making the chip, they should give in the software features that will allow the users to define the level of protection, to, uh, to, uh, to identify hacking, to what to do this in this case. So they, they need to give not just fire and forget. There is a responsibility for making making systems to attack to uh, to uh, take care to add, to address to these issues. And I think a company, this is a hint to ST, a company that will be the best in this field will have a technology. It, 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 it will have an advantage because everybody knows how to make sensors, but how to protect information, it's very difficult. 
Well, you can see. I mean, if I could comment, uh, the solution we provide is uh, based on a microcontroller. And nothing better than a microcontroller can handle security on data. So uh, our solution inherently is uh, on the path of doing that. Because uh, I fully it, agree with. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't... Yep, please. No, it's okay. I, I finished. No, I, I, sorry, I didn't uh, didn't want to interrupt. But you absolutely agree. And but it's not enough to be on the microcontroller level. Maybe you can put some security on the sensor level. Some hard, also hardware security, not only software security. Uh, because people can hack, you know, your computer camera. People can, people can. So you need to put. Uh, regarding the security, uh, we believe in the system that we develop. It has to be to be in every level. I agree. Microprocessor is the is the heart of security. But I think we have to do a more uh, hardware. And even in the biology, I can put some bits of security. Since I'm doing genetical engineering. I can do some security to know that somebody is, or even if somebody steals the information, I can detect that this is my information. So, so if I want to sue somebody, I need some evidence. So I can put some pieces in the DNA. That if somebody copy my, if I, if, I, if I design a new type of rice using bioengineering, I can make it uh, labeled. Or it's called digital, uh, digital I can, and I put a label in the DNA. So. I agree with you, but we have to be, uh, you know, to, to go out of the box, we have to first to be inside the box. So we are inside the box now, but we need also to put something out. It's a war, I mean, it's a war between us and the hackers and they, we, we have to be one step ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I comment on that. Uh, what I see is that uh, I fully agree with what you said. Uh, we have already experience with, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the chip, the microchips that we have on the credit cards. So the level of security there is very high and inherently integrated into our microchips, which most of the times are microcontrollers. So what I I, I want to mention is a uh, it's a feature that the uh, technologically is is uh, an add-on. It's not something that we need to think about how to do it in the future. It's just something to add. Uh, getting energy from somewhere, I said, is a step forward. It's something that uh, we are understanding and we are uh, doing. So security is just a matter of resources, or what I have to put on the chip when I, I design it. or uh, But it's something that we really know how to do it. It's not something, it's just a matter of specification and implementing it. Um, it's a different <laughs> problem than how to get, for instance, uh, power, how to think about or doing a sensor where the power is limited, is intermittent, uh, or uh, I, I don't have a stable power. And even adding security, of course, it requires power. So we need to understand how to provide the power for this uh, high level of security, because uh, uh, if I add the security, maybe I need uh, uh, to negotiate the kind of security I have to not only to transmit, but also be able to receive and all these features. So the impact I see is not really on putting codes uh, or on a memory or something like that, but how in the kind of protocol that could be uh, complicated to handle from the power point of view. Energy is necessary for uh, the function of increasing the level of security. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Manuela. Yes. Uh, as Maurizio said, that I am a plant pathologist and uh, so I have always microbes in my mind. So I would like to ask you if uh, uh, you agree um, that um, reliable sensors are reliable and maybe almost continuously working sensor uh, giving us information about the plant microbes relations uh, is still a an open challenge. Or uh, this are we is... closer to have something to to perform that kind of analysis of microbiota, plant microbiota, soil microbiota, and so on? Yes. Is this a question for me? Or... For everybody. <laughs> I, I I think that uh, we we uh, Roberto, you can begin if you have uh, uh, an answer to this question. Oh. 
Well, what we see is that, uh, uh, as I said before, we are trying heavily to get uh, energy out of, of the bacteries uh, which are present on the soil. Uh, this is uh, for us a disruptive, te disruptive technology because, uh, well, first of all, it's not intermittent like could be photovoltaic. So we get energy uh, all the time. Uh, depending on the frequency that we need to have to monitor, uh, for us, the power doesn't have to be huge, okay? Um, but the con the interesting concept that we foresee is that not only we get energy from the uh, the bacteria, but we can also understand the density of the bacteria. Because the minute the, the density of the bacteria is going down, we see also that the power is going down. And now we're, uh, also the rate of our communication is, is going is going longer. And this is something we can see very quickly. So, in other words, we are really studying how uh, a plant microbial fuel cell could be an indirect way to be a, a biosensor of, of course, of primary order for the plant. Because a, a, a dead plant uh, does not have, a, 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 a long, in long time, does not have any activity. It doesn't provide me any energy. And if I don't have any energy, I have the information that maybe something is wrong with the plant. So what we are studying heavily is not only how to get energy uh, out of the bacteria, uh, also how to understand their density if they are uh, active. Of course, uh, at the moment, I don't see how uh, without only only with uh, the plant microbial cell, we can understand which kind of bacteria we have there. Okay, But the density of the bacteria, this is possible to know uh, for free. So Roberto. Also for free. Maybe just a comment from my side on the bacteria in the soil. I mean, it's interesting to uh, take power from the bacteria and it's, it is a way to indirectly measure the concentration, like the, the population of the bacteria in the soil. But at the same time, we also need to consider that we might actually be affecting the soil environment itself by doing that. So uh, uh, it's a possibility, no, but... but we need to take that into account. Yeah, but we are not putting the bacteria. Uh, I mean, we're using the bacteria that are present in the soil, so already. So we are basically feeding the bacteria through the plants. Uh, the concept uh, is based on the fact that we have uh, we are not putting any bacteria. So those uh, electrogenetic bacteria are already present in a, almost any soil uh, in, present in the world. The only the trick here is to feed the bacteria because if you put a bacteria in the soil and you leave it there without doing anything, they will die. So you need uh, to feed them somehow. Um, the problem is, so you're doing a battery somehow that you need to, to feed. In the laboratory, we put some sugar every day, but this is the maintenance operation. What is the trick? The trick is that we put a plant and the plant uh, out of uh, um, the flot photosynthesis is uh, uh, putting some glucosium that is uh, basically feeding the bacteria. I, I understand. I the understand trick is my that we, are, we have a maintenance of the plant that is uh, coincident with the maintenance of the uh, of, of the uh, battery, in this case, of, of the plant microbial for itself. No, I understand. I, I, I agree with you. It's just that when you start uh, messing around with the population of the bacteria in the soil, certain plants will require a certain combination of bacteria of to, to grow. So when you change that balance, you're changing the equilibrium. So I'm just saying we need to take into account what the effect that would have on the plant itself. No, I understand your concern, but uh, for me, it's important to clear now that we are not tricking uh, or working or tweaking bacteria. So we, whatever is present, we are trying to get energy. That's it. Okay. okay, so we, we are not putting bacteria or try to, I mean, there's no chemical from our point of view. We are passive. If there are bacteria, we understand that we get the energy we work. That's all. Yoshi, do you have uh, an opinion? I'm, I'm, my opinion is that techno the technology is available. It's, uh, it's, uh, I agree with my, it's a matter of time now. If we, the problem that, the, there's too many microbes. <laughs> so we have to, we, we still need some time to develop the right sensors to make the sensors, but the technology is available. Yeah. It's something similar to what is going on in our gut. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
which in fact it's a it's the same issue that is they're trying to do with capsules ingestible capsules and they want to take power for those capsules through the uh, microbes in the intestine so it's a completely different field but it's the same approach yeah exactly so uh, okay uh, i think that uh, we if we do not have uh, any other uh, question, we can close uh, the round table. Uh, it has been very interesting. Uh, I think that uh, I, I also appreciate uh, uh, really the, the, the bioconvergence, uh, the possibility to have a biocomputer. Uh, I do not know how far is this uh, object, uh, this, this, uh, this possibility. Uh, but I think that uh, probably in the next edition uh, of the conference, we will uh, make uh, some progress about uh, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, so I uh, thank you, uh, the, the, the speaker. I thank you, all the, the organizer. I think I thank you also, the public. Uh, and uh, I, I give you uh, for the next... Uh, uh, for the next for the next edition of this uh, conference, I think that uh, we reach uh, about two hundred and fifty uh, participants. So I think that uh, it is uh, uh, a conference that uh, uh, is able uh, to collect uh, interest that uh, uh, we can have the possibility to grow uh, for the next time. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Good you. Day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.